Hey guys, what is up? Super K-Man Rocks here, and we are here for my LEC Spring Split Week 1 Overview Analysis. And of course, at the end, my updated power rankings. We're in the Spring Split officially now for the LEC Winter Split is done. I previewed everything that I am expecting to happen in the spring split, all of the changes, the roster changes, maybe some of the improvements that I'm expecting. You can go check that video out up in the iCard right now if you want to get a good idea of where my head is at. Moving into this first week, of course, those are my preliminary power rankings for this split as well, but this is the week where we really start to figure out which teams are real and which teams are not. A lot of changes happen across the middle of the split, more than I was ever expecting, and Honestly, this split could be a lot of fun to watch. So, before we jump into it, let me know down in the comment section below what team you were most excited to see debut, quote-unquote, in this week. What roster changes were you most excited to see all actually play the game, not just on paper? I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts and feedback on that down in the comment section below. But without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it. Of course, we're going to be covering all 15 games in the LEC week number one. Yes, three days, 15 games. Really excited, but... Let's not waste too much time. That's a lot of games to get into, so we should go ahead and get into them, starting off with day number one. And we kick day number one off with a Brexit battle, a battle of the bottom teams, Excel taking on Fnatic. Really excited to see this, obviously. These are the two teams that missed the top eight last split, so this is their chance at revenge. One of them is going to be starting off 1-0, and that team is Excel here. And honestly, I can't say I'm surprised. I know I ranked Excel lower than Fnatic in my preseason power rankings, but that's mostly just because, I, uh, you know, of last split. It's, it's really just kind of giving the nod to the fact that Excel has to show it on the Rift before I really believe in them, but this is a Fnatic team I'm pretty out on. I talked about that in my preseason predictions, and an Excel team that I feel should be better. Like, as long as they have some semblance of macro play, they should be a at least a competitive team in the region. They should not be bottom two, and I think they showed that in this game here. Really solid effort basically from everybody, but it was a pretty easy choice for player of the game. That one's going to go to Odo Amne in the top lane. At the beginning of last split, he was also the player that I think was most, I don't know, being active and positive for Excel. Uh, I know it kind of trailed off as the split went on. You know, in the last couple of weeks, Odo Amne wasn't exactly lighting the world on fire. But I would say over the beginning portion of the winter split, Odo Omne was definitely this team's best player. He was the one that was kind of keeping the season alive for them. And it was just everybody else that really wasn't living up to expectations. And, you know, that seems to be the case again, that Odo was the best player. Luckily, it seems like the rest of the team is at least trying to play. I think Odo obviously was great on the Cassante. He obliterated Oscar Rinnan in lane, which we'll get to. But for Odo to step up and kind of look really strong on a pick that I think, generally speaking, plays directly into his strengths as a player, it's just a really good sign. And if you're an Excel fan, you've got to be hoping that he's going to be able to keep that up. He wasn't the only player on the team to play well, but he might be one of the most influential players on Excel. When he is playing well, this team has a power point on the side of the map that not a lot of LEC teams can actually match. Odo is underrated as a, as a strong side player. He always has been. Yes, he's very good as a weak side player, and that's the reason he's kind of developed that uh, reputation, I guess you could say, is because he probably is the best weak side top laner in the region, but he is really good as a strong side top as well if you did want to play into him. So Odo looking really solid in this one. I think the other player that I want to shout out is actually Patrick in the bot lane. I know people aren't going to be incredibly high on Patrick after what last split was, but we've seen what he can do at an LEC level before. We know he has the mechanics. We know he has the team fighting ability. I think a pick like Zeri fits right up his alley, and so if his team can survive long enough to get him to the part of the game where he is most effective, which is the back half of the team fighting section, I still think that he can be an incredibly solid and an incredibly useful LEC player. Very similar to a player like Neon in that regard, but I like Patrick. I thought he played well here. He had a good laning phase. Wasn't like the best of all time, but you're going into Zaya Heimerdinger. You're not exactly going to be dominating that lane in terms of pressure. I just thought him and Limit showed a good amount of chemistry considering it was their first stage game. That's kind of what I wanted to see. VTO was really helping out the map. Xerxe was kind of limiting a lot of the mistakes that he was making early on in games earlier this year. Overall, I just really like what Excel was able to do in this game. They basically showed me everything I wanted to see, and that's that's good. That There's really nothing else I could ask for. As for Fnatic on the other side... This is not how you wanted to kick off your season. You probably wanted to kick it off with a win, but at the very least, you wanted to be competitive. And this really wasn't competitive. You kind of got run over in this game. I talked about this 
a bit in my preseason predictions, but a big reason why I thought you were bringing Oscar Rinnan into the top lane over someone like Wonder is to play to him a bit more. He is very much a carry-oriented player, or that's very much what he was in Superliga, and so I expected that to be kind of his role here, especially with Reckless and Advien in the bot lane kind of being more of a weak side bot lane. I expected them to want to play to top side more. That really wasn't what happened in this game. They wanted to play to mid lane a lot again, which again, I understand. Like, Razork and Humanoid are the two most talented players on the team, but we'll get to them. Their synergy has simply just not improved at any point over the time that they have played together. But Oscar Rinnan got destroyed in the 1v1 top lane. He's going to get my dud of the game here. It's just not the debut that you were looking for. He played a ton of NAR in Superliga this year, and it looked really, really good. So it's kind of frustrating to see him come up to the main roster and immediately be given it and not really have it pan out now. Do I think that you could have gone for something more aggressive? Absolutely, especially with like Talia Zaya. Like you can really go for, you know, something a little bit more aggro, something that can punish the Cassante a tad bit more in lane. I know they banned out things like the Gangplank, but like Gwen is up and I don't think Gwen is a particularly bad pick here. Um, I think that there were other options other than the Gnar and I don't necessarily think that played exactly into his strengths, even if it is his best pick. I just think that maybe you were looking for something a little bit more aggro, but he was far from the only player who played bad. I thought Razork and Humanoid were not very good in this game. Uh, again, I can't reiterate enough. They just don't have a lot of synergy together. They are talented players, but this game showcased that in spades where it's like Razork would go in with ultimate, you know, way before anybody else on the team was ready. And then, you know, five seconds later, Humanoid would blow his entire kit. And it's like, if you guys just fought together, you would probably win. Like you have strength in these comps. It's just, you're not playing towards it. So it's frustrating to see that. Humanoid also has regressed a lot from his ability to get out on the map. It's something he's never really been all that good at. He is a very resource heavy mid laner, not someone who really wants to shove and roam and look to move around the map with his jungler. But that means probably don't put him on a champion like Talia, where that's kind of her main draw. Overall, just did not like how the top side played. Reckless and Advien were fine. Honestly, they were by far the best players on Fnatic in this game. And, you know, that's not particularly surprising. When the team go, you know, usually when Fnatic goes wrong, uh, it's not Reckless's fault. And it's not to say that he's the best player on the team, but what he does is typically limit mistakes. And so he's not really going to be making a bunch of the egregious errors, even if he's not also driving the team into a victory. So for Fnatic... You know, I I'm worried. Like, honestly, I was worried about Fnatic going into the year. I didn't think their roster on paper was really all that talented. And I think seeing how they played in week number one or in this first game only get serves to give me more worries. I, I think this very well could be a bottom two team still this year. And there's a real chance that they are the worst team in the league. But for Excel, this is exactly how you wanted to kick off the season. You already tied the amount of wins that you got last year which is a good sign. I think this team is going to be much improved this split compared to what they were last split. Top six might still be a little bit out of reach or at least a little bit over their heads at the moment, but... You know, a big win over Fnatic to start off their season is exactly what this team needed to get the confidence to maybe outperform the expectations that even I have been given to them. Then moving on to our second game of day number one, and it's another intriguing matchup. Two of the teams that overperformed the most coming out of last split. We had Team BDS taking on SK Gaming. And SK Gaming is able to pick up a pretty big win here, kind of solidifying themselves in that upper tier. BDS is certainly no slouch. They didn't exactly play this game super perfectly, but, you know, this is not a team to be overlooked by any stretch. And uh, SK really came in and proved that they deserve to be in that upper echelon, just like they did last split. This team is really good, and it's really good to see them come out and prove that again here. They basically get everything they want. They got full comfort. Irrelevant on the Gnar, that's probably his best champion. Certus on the Akali, we always talk about the melee mids for him. Markoon on the Vi, Exegek and Doss on something they can be a little bit aggressive on in the early game. This is the kind of comp that SK Gaming really wants to play, and they're going into, yes, a Wombo-oriented comp on the side of BDS with the Yasuo, the Jarvan, the Gragas, their there's a ton of options for them to be able to kind of get these picks in the mid game, but it didn't look like they were nearly as comfortable on the champions that they were playing. So let's talk about SK first. Player of the game for me, it's got to go to Irrelevant in the top lane. He's been really good over the years so far. And I kind of predicted that. I think a lot of people were low on him going into the year. I very much wasn't. I had him as my fourth top laner in the region going into uh, Winter Split, which turned out to be probably about accurate, somewhere right around there. He was kind of in that zone, maybe a little bit lower. There were a couple players that I think were a little bit more carry-oriented, but... 
Irrelevant just plays his role and does his job so well, so much better than almost anybody else in the LEC, that he is an absolute asset to have on a team like SK that does have carries around him, but it was his play that was really the shining moment for SK in this game. That four-man gnarl towards the back half of the game. Not really sure why BDS was all clumping up around a wall with a gnar flanking, but... It is what it is. Irrelevant was able to get that four-man gnarled off, and then the fight was basically over. Certus was getting executes off. Exit Kick was absolutely destroying with damage on the Zaya. I mean, it was just an absolute wombo all set up by Irrelevant's plays. It wasn't just in the late game, though. He did a really good job pressuring on that Gnar in the early game. This is what I wanted to see out of Oscar Rinnan on Fnatic in the previous game, unfortunately. It took Irrelevant picking the thing to come out and really be dominant, but the Gnar was really, really impressive in this game and very difficult to deal with. Other players on the team that I think played well. Certus in the mid lane on the Akali. Got some major leads on Nuke. This is supposed to happen in this matchup. The Akali into Gragas matchup is pretty Akali favored and obviously if you're able to get out on the map, if you're able to make plays, if you're able to generate your own lead, there's really not a lot that the Gragas can do to actually stop you in that regard and unfortunately for Crowny on the other side, he's on an immobile AD carry and he's a very aggressive player so... Sometimes Aphelios is going to be pushed up a little bit too far, and he's going to be a very nice execute target for that Akali, and Sirtis was able to generate a lot of gold off of that. I would say the solo laners, definitely the standout members, but Marcoon was really good in the jungle. Exekick was good on the Zaya, maybe caught out a bit more than I would have liked, and I thought Doss was actually really good on the Rakan, but overall... SK Gaming looking just like they did when they finished off the season in top four in the winter split. This team is incredibly solid, and honestly, I might have underrated them by putting them at number five in my power rankings. This team is really, really good, and they do have a superstar, and so they might be one of the better teams in the entire league. As for BDS... Frustrating loss, probably not how you wanted to kick off your split, but at least it's to a good team in SK Gaming. The unfortunate part is that it felt like your main players were the ones who kind of disappointed here. You were putting a lot of pressure on Adam and Crowney, which generally speaking, I would say is a good draft strategy for BDS because I do think that they are by far the two most talented BDS players and the two that have kind of pushed this team forward the most, but neither of them really played all that well in this game. Crowney's going to get my dud of the game here. He was just out of position a lot. If he was a little bit more careful, a little bit safer on the Aphelios, especially towards the back half of this game, maybe they could have turned some stuff. You really need to get that Aphelios online for this comp to work, unless the Yasuo is super fed, but Crowney was just pushing up, and he was a great target for Certus. and eventually that Akali just became too much for the Aphelios to actually try and deal with, and I just don't think it was a very good game from him. It wasn't like an off game. There have been worse games by AD carries throughout this year so far, but I would say this one was definitely probably the weakest on BDS. I don't think LeBrav really helped him out on the Annie. Both of them were kind of caught out of position a little bit too much for my taste. And then you, you got Yasuo, Jarvan, Gragas. Like, there is so much wombo potential here for Adam to be able to try and take over the game. Unfortunately, he just lost the top lane matchup pretty hard. I know, you know, Yasuo Nar is a bit of a, uh, a bit of a, a weighted matchup, <laughs> would you say? But um, at the end of the day, Adam should have been able to be a lot better here. And he just wasn't. Like, this wasn't a very good showing from him. You know, obviously, he's kind of a feast or famine player. He's always willing to pull out some of these weird picks. It's good to see this team kind of have an idea for a playstyle that they might want to execute that maybe other teams wouldn't want to go towards. But it, you didn't look very comfortable on it. I'm not sure how practiced the team was on it. I'm not sure how many games of Yasuo Adam was actually playing in preparation for this one. But the team just didn't look like they were ready to pull this comp out. The two main carries really didn't step up. And it's not like the supporting cast was bad. But what are they really going to do? What's a Jarvan? What's a Gragas going to do? In an instance where the Yasuo and the Aphelios are not going to be able to deal the damage in the late game. So overall, it's a frustrating loss for BDS. But for the most part, I think this is reboundable. This team is still really talented. And I think if they just get something that they're a little bit more comfortable on, maybe kind of go back to meta a tad bit, they're going to be fine. As for SK on the other side, this team is genuinely good. They are not just like a random team in the top of the standings that kind of got lucky in winter. This team has a lot of talent on it. Irrelevant is really good. Marcoon is really good. Certus has improved a lot. Exekick and Doss are one of the best bot lanes in Europe. This team has a ton of talent and a ton of potential and I'm really just hoping that they continue this winning streak because SK really is one of those teams that is the most fun to watch in the LEC. And then moving on to our third game of day number one, and this one I was really looking forward to. Not only was it a finals team from last split, but a team that maybe upgraded the most of anybody in between the splits. We had Mad Lions taking on Team Vitality. 
And Vitality does get the job done. They are able to pick up the win with their new AD carry and upset in the game. Really like this game from Vitality. They just outplayed them. I know a lot of people are going to blame Draft for this. Again, because LEC fans love to blame Draft in particular. But Vitality was much better as a team in terms of executing on their draft advantage that they were able to generate. And honestly, they had a great game plan going into this. They knew that they could flex the Gragas, so they picked it early. That can go to Perks, that can go to Photon, that can go to Bo. I mean, hell, that could probably go to Kaiser. Like, he can probably play that. It's a really good pick. Uh, Mad does not respect that. They end up taking the blind Shogath because they think they're going into something like the Gragas in the mid lane. That ends up getting turned into an Aurelian Soul, and now you're playing Thresh into Caitlyn. You're playing Shogath into Aesol. You're playing Leeson into Gragas. You're playing Gnar into Darius. These are all not particularly great matchups, but they're winnable. Again, if Elioya in particular has a good early game, then it becomes a lot easier for Mad Lions to be able to win. And while Yoya wasn't the worst player on the team, in fact, I would argue that he is the best player on the team in this game, it just isn't enough to take down what Vitality had in this game, which was a lot of fire. So let's talk about it. Player of the game was actually really hard in this one because there were a lot of players on Vitality that played particularly well. I'm going to personally give it to Kaiser in the support position on this Heimerdinger, mostly because it felt like he had the most noticeable impact on the function of how this game went. You can give it to Perks on this Aesol, and I totally understand. You can give it to Upset on this Caitlyn, and I, I kind of understand. But for me, it's going to go to Kaiser in this support position. The support gap in this game was massive. Both Karzi and Hillisang were just not good on the side of Mad Lions, and a lot of that was the pressure that Kaiser was putting on them. They end up outplaying a dive in the bot lane really, really well, ending up generating a large lead for this Caitlyn. And then they just never look back. Kaiser is pressuring, pressuring, pressuring not only in lane, but around the map as well. That's something that I think Heimerdinger players sometimes forget to do is roam and actually play for the map. This champion is so difficult to deal with if he's out and about. I know that he's a lot stronger in the lane 2v2, but you can do both. Like, it is very easy to do both. Help out your mid laner and help out your jungler and also help out your bot laner, right? And that's what Kaiser does. At his best, Kaiser's one of the best supports in the region, if not the best support, because he's willing to move around the map. He's willing to sacrifice his own resources in order to get the rest of the team ahead, and I think that's a great example of what happened in this game. I love Kaiser, and he looked a lot more comfortable in this game than he did really at any point across the uh, the winter split. Um, as for the rest of the team, Perks was awesome on this Aurelian Soul. I think Broadcast gave player of the game to Perks, and I totally understand why. This Aesol was a lot of fun to watch. He was really, really impactful in the game. He not only won early, which is a problem uh, for the other team if Aesol wins early, but obviously that champion's going to do a ridiculous amount of damage in the mid to late game if he's left to his own devices, and Perks piloted it really well. I, I'm notoriously high on Perks on this channel. He's someone who, you know, I'm going to probably go down swinging with, but um, he kind of proved me right in this game. I thought Bo was really good on the Gragas. Photon looked good in the counter matchup in the top lane, even if it was a little bit boring because it's top lane every once in a while. And then upset in his debut, picks the Caitlyn and dominates the bot lane. He was able to generate a large lead early. Obviously, the failed dive doesn't necessarily help things, but basically from that point onwards, he's just the better player and he's able to completely outplay everything that Matt ends up doing. He ends up being a huge nuisance. I always talk about this. Those Caitlyn crits really hurt, even in the mid game where she's supposed to be, you know, kind of weaker than maybe some of these other champions. She's still incredible. Incredibly difficult to deal with in a lot of these skirmishes at one and two items. And so, Upset piloting her well, but Upset and Kaiser seem to have really good chemistry together overall. Just really happy with how Vitality played this game. Not really a lot of complaints. They basically played a perfect one in this one. As for Matt on the other side, definitely not what you wanted to see after a finals appearance to come right back out and get destroyed, but at least it was by a good team in Vitality. But there definitely are some question marks. That bot lane did not hold up throughout the playoffs. Even in the series that they won, they were definitely a little bit of an issue for the team, and that was only exacerbated in this series. Karzi and Hillisang were really bad in this game. Hilly is going to get my dud of the game, but you could very realistically give this to Karzi as well, who might I add participated in zero kills across this game, but Hill is saying playing Thresh into Caitlyn is just a nightmare, like I don't really understand what the idea behind this is, it's never really going to be an easy matchup for you, you're never really going to be able to actually land any of your CC, that's not even considering the fact that you're playing into a Heimerdinger and then he just played so aggro, they went for these crazy plays that were just so low percentage plays, right, like I, I always advocate for playing aggro, but 
Maybe not in a way where you're taking like 30 70s. That's not necessarily what I would advise. And unfortunately, that's a lot of what Hillisang was taking in this game. This showed a lot of the bad parts of the Karzi Hillisang bot lane. We kind of praised them in the regular season last year because they were aggressive and it felt like their aggressive 2v2 tendencies were kind of beneficial to them because it allowed them to generate leads that other bot lanes just weren't able to get. But this is the other side of the coin, right? This is the flip side of that argument where sometimes you're a little bit over-aggressive and it ends up costing you the entire game, and that was the case for Mad here. Niski was also really bad on the Cho'Gath. Again, really shitty matchup, but you gotta at least try to keep the Aurelian Soul in check, and Niski could not do that in this game. Chasey was kind of boring in the top lane. Now, Yo-Yo was alright in the jungle. He had some moments, but for the most part, lost pressure early due to the Gragas and never really got it back throughout this game. Mad just kind of got bounced, right? This was a destruction of a Mad Lions team that just made the finals, and, you know, that's bad for Mad Lions. It's certainly not what you want to see. It's certainly not how you wanted to kick off your spring split, but this team has shown the resilience to be able to bounce back from things like this. I still think they're going to be just fine, but maybe you're looking at some of these draft picks and, and realizing maybe we want to go a little bit later with some of them. Uh, as for Vitality on the other side, this was a bounce. This was a destruction, and that's huge. This team was just in the finals, and you obliterated them. I know this team was really good in the regular season, and then obviously they had their struggles once they got to the group stage, ended up not even making the top four, but talent-wise, Vitality is right there with G2 at the top of the standings, and that's why I felt confident putting them at number two in my preseason power rankings. I still think this team is going to be incredibly solid, and this game proved me right. I think upset and Kaiser are really interesting as a bot lane, and this was a great first showing from them, but if Perks and Bo and Photon continue to play at a high level, they might not even need these guys to step up and be awesome because this team is just loaded with talent basically from top to support. And then moving on to our fourth game of day number one, and this one's another little bit of an upset. Definitely a team I did not expect to come out and win early on in the season. We had Astralis taking on Koi, and Astralis picks up the win here. Koi finishing in the top three last split, ending up making the semifinals, but not being able to get past Mad Lions. But, you know, obviously that was an improvement over what they showed in the regular season, which was barely making it out of the bottom two. And then Astralis, on the other hand, very similar, barely making it out of the bottom two, but putting up a real fight in the group stage and just running into a very competitively talented Mad Lions team. Unfortunately for Koi, Astralis seems to have carried that momentum a bit further into this season than maybe they have as they pick up the win here in a really clean 28-minute game. Honestly, this is not the kind of game I expected a team like Astralis to be playing. I think Koi obviously makes a little bit more sense for this style, but even then, not so much. This was a very slow-paced, very methodical, very macro-oriented game, something that I think most people would associate with something like the LCK rather than the LEC, but... Hey, you know, when you've got an LCK or a former LCK Challengers League support kind of guiding the way for your team, maybe the team's going to look a little bit better macro-wise. Uh, that's a nice segue into my player of the game, which is Jonghoon in that support position. He's just so good. It's still incredible to me that Astralis was able to find him and bring him in last year because truthfully, it is just kind of a marvel that he was found in general. Not only was he on the worst Challengers League team in Breon in 2021, but he wasn't even playing in spring of 2022. He didn't have a team, and then all of a sudden he gets brought in by Astralis, some great scouting work, and he becomes one of the more interesting supports in the entire region, and that has continued on into 2023. He played awesome in this game on the Nautilus. Obviously, these hook champions that are a little bit more aggressive, especially in the mid game, are things that he really likes to try and take advantage of into scaling bot lanes, and that's exactly what he did in this game. Nautilus can be a pretty feast or famine pick, especially in the current meta, but Jonghoon made it look like the strongest support in the world. Those engages were always clean. Trimby just could not play the game in the bot lane 2v2, and Kabe got super fed because of it. Now, no flame to Kabe. I'm, I'm not trying to say that he didn't play well this game, but Jonghoon was definitely the one setting up a lot of those plays, in my opinion, and he definitely deserves the player of the game. I think Broadcast gave it to Kabe. I understand 4-0-3 is a really good scoreline. His positioning on the Zaya is solid. Uh, I don't want to take away from the fact that he was good this game. I just think Jonghoon was a little bit more explosive, just a tad bit better in my eyes, but both players playing really well, and this bot lane continues to be a huge positive for an Astralis team that, you know, elsewhere on the map is relatively weak, and or at least that's what we thought. I would say the rest of these players played well in this game, but, you know, we assumed that they would be relatively weak. Kabe and Jonghoon, definitely the strong points of them in winter, and that looks to 
to continue here in spring. But let's go ahead and talk about Leader because we haven't really mentioned him. It's his first game back in the LEC here on Astralis, and he honestly looked pretty good. For a melee specialist, he looked all right on the rise. Obviously, I'm joking around, but uh, it's good to see him get his confidence back. It feels like he's come in with something to prove, and I think that's going to be a really good thing. Mid lane is super stacked in the LEC, obviously. You know, going up against Larson in your first game isn't exactly the easiest challenge in the world. Luckily for them, they drafted the Gragas mid, and so they went for the lower damage comp that allows Leader to scale up a bit, play for the macro a lot in the mid game, and that really helps out the team. Some of those Rise ultimates were really, really good coming out from him, but I would say the third best player on this team behind Kabe and Jonghoon in this game was 1-1-3 in the jungle, and I'm really, really happy to say that. I'm still a little bit lower on him than maybe some other analysts are. He had an okay split. I don't necessarily think he had a great split in winter, and going up against a player like Maorang, I expected him to be a little little bit outpaced because that's kind of what's happened in a lot of their losses last split but it was the exact opposite he completely outpaced Malrang he had significantly less farm and significantly more of an impact on the map on a champion like Elise which is just a really good sign it's good to know that 113 could kind of adapt his play style go for these more aggressive plays on an early game champion like Elise get his Zaya ahead make sure that his Renekton is in a good spot it's just really good to see that, especially into a player like Malrang that is usually doing the exact thing that I'm talking about on the other side of the map. So 1-1-3, Kabe, Jonghoon, Leader, and Finn were also good, but those were the main standouts, in my opinion, for Astralis in this game. And then Koi on the other side, it's just the same story as it was in the regular season of Winter, where it's like, I don't really know where this team is at. This team didn't play particularly well in this game. They were super slow in the kind of decisions that they wanted to make, which doesn't really make a ton of sense to me, because he drafted Lee Sin Gragas, and that means... You probably need to play a little bit more aggressive in the early game, or you're probably just going to get outscaled. And while that wasn't exactly what happened, it was Koi that was letting their foot off the gas at the beginning, and uh, Astral was really taking advantage of it with a strong early game comp, and then they just kind of finished the game from there. Koi's just one of those teams where I really don't know where to put them in terms of, like, rankings or even just, like, a feeling. Like, are they good? Are they bad? I don't really know. They are so back and forth in terms of how they play the game, specifically this bot lane. There are times where they look like the 2022 version of what they were, and then there are times where they look like one of the bottom three bot lanes in the entire region. This was one of those games. Trimby's gonna get dud of the game for me. Comp absolutely could have got it as well. You could give it to either member of this bot lane. They just got hard outplayed by Kabe and Jonghoon. It really wasn't even all that close. They had no pressure in lane, which is okay. Again, it's Zeri and Renata into Zaya and Nautilus, so I get giving over pressure early, but their usefulness in the back half of this game was almost non- existent. It's not like Astralis had a ridiculous gold lead. They definitely had a gold lead and they kind of suffocated it out with objectives, but Comp and Trimby were in a position where they should have been able to at least contest, and it just felt like they were so far behind from early game mishaps that there really was no way for them to get back into the game. Overall, I just, I don't like how this bot lane is playing, and I've said it for a while, but Koi kind of runs through this bot lane. It doesn't really matter if Larson and Shigenda and Malrang are playing well. If Comp and Trimby aren't playing well, this team doesn't really win games. That was kind of proven over the course of the regular season. Now, what was also proven over the course of the regular season is that this team can step up when it matters the most. Trimby in particular had a really good playoffs, and I think a lot of these players really are solid, but again, I just need to see the consistency come out of this team. We know that their highs are strong, but their lows seem to be very weak, and that's concerning for a team that I think wants to compete to be a team that goes to MSI. As for Astralis on the other side, though, they're way better than they should be. I mean, they're just going to continue to outperform expectations. I'm still kind of waiting for the fall off because, again, I'm not super high on the individual talent, especially of the top side of the map, but this team works as a unit. They play what they're comfortable on, and they're going to be able to take advantage of some of these teams that maybe aren't as consistent. And that's huge. Astralis very well could be a team that breaks their way into the top six again, which would be a massive overachievement for this roster and for this organization just in general. And then moving on to our final game of day number one, of course, here in the three-day weeks that we have in the LEC. We had our defending champions take the rift for the first time in Spring Split. We had Team Heretics taking on G2 Esports. And of course, G2 does pick up the win. It's good to see them go straight from winning the finals to winning their first game of Spring. Always good to see the momentum kind of carry over. And this is a very G2 draft for them to do it in. Not only are they able to pick up the Draven for Han Sama, which is just... I, I still can't believe teams are giving this over so willy-nilly. It is what it is, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But even just the rest of the draft is very G2. It's a very Yasuo-oriented comp without a Yasuo in it. You've got the Malphite, you've got the Jarvan, you've got the Gragas, a lot of things that you would typically associate with, like, quote-unquote Yasuo comps. But generally speaking, they're all really good in their own right. Of course, the Jarvan can facilitate a lot of plays in the mid-game. Gragas is just generally good right now. His numbers are high as either a tank or as a damage carry in the AP role. And then you've got Malphite mid as a direct counter 
counter to something like the Jace, and that's a really, really strong pick if played by somebody who can actually play him at a high level like Caps can, and so... For G2, I actually really like what they were able to do in this game. Of course, any game where G2 picks Draven and puts it on Hansama, it immediately just becomes a Draven game. That's almost all games where Draven is drafted. But especially for this team in general, if you get that 2v2 or that 3v3 in the bot lane early on in the game that goes the way of G2, the game is just essentially over at that point. Hans is going to be able to snowball with that Draven pick. And guess what? We got a 3v3 bot lane at around like four minutes into the game that went G2's way. Draven got all the gold and now the game is over. Hansama is going to dominate the lane he's going to dominate the mid game and there's really not a lot that heretics can do about it it's really unfortunate to watch teams continuously fall into this trap but pretty easy choice for player of the game it's going to go to han sama on the draven every single time that he has played this champion not only has g2 won but han sama has dominated at some point you just got to take him off of it i know g2 can win on other things so don't take this the wrong way but at some point you just got to say let them win on something else right like anything else let them beat me on the Lilia in the jungle or the Belveth in the jungle or anything Caps wants to pull out. Just not the Draven, right? I give up. Give up trying to beat the Draven. That's the point I think I'm trying to make. It's not working out for any team. And that includes a team like Team Heretics that just doesn't have the skill to be able to rebound from an early deficit like that. Props to G2. They know exactly how to play around their super carry. Hans looks so much better in 2023 than he does in 2022, obviously. He talked a bit about how he was just completely mentally checked out in North America. Clearly, he just... You know, more so wanted to play closer to home, which, hey, if that's what's going to take to get you your best performance, you know, I may not, I may not like it from a mentality standpoint, but it, whatever wins, wins, right? Hans looks a lot better back in the LEC, looks like Prime Hans. Again, obviously gets to play with Mickey, who is one of the better supports in the entire world, and he has been for a long time now. He's back in form on G2 when these two are playing well in the bot lane together. They're the best bot lane in the league. I know some people are going to talk about SK Gaming, and I do really like Exekick, but I think in terms of like general bot lanes, I think Hans and Mickey are probably number one for me right now in terms of what they're able to output. Although Vitality is certainly making a case as well, but Hans, that's not to take away from Hans and Mickey. They're still really good. Caps offers you so much flexibility as a player. He can pull out the Malphite mid. He can play the Zac. He can play the Sejuani. He can do whatever you really need him to do in that mid lane role, and he, he filled his role here. Obviously, kind of destroying counterpicking Ruby in the mid lane on that Jace. There's really not a lot that Jace can do into Malphite. It's notoriously awful matchup for him even in the top lane and so for it to be coming down to the mid lane here it's just not really going to change all that much Caps is really good at the game he built freaking Sheen on Malphite which is just like okay sure do whatever you want your Caps honestly I'm deferring to you you can kind of play however you want it ends up working out for him and then Yike and Broken Blade also have a really solid game Yike in particular knows exactly who he needs to get ahead early on in the game and he goes down bot and he gets it done so G2 kind of playing their strategy kind of playing their style and it definitely works out for them as for Heretics on the other side they're just not not super good. Uh, like, I I'm very low on this team. You could have predicted that from my preseason predictions. They're one of the teams that I'm predicting to finish in the bottom two in spring, and this is kind of why, is because they just don't really have that X-Factor player. Yankos is really good for this team, and he was really good in this game. He actually had a lot of really nice plays on the Elise. He was generating a lot of gold, not only for himself in the early game, but for his team in the mid game as well. Just really nice positioning, knows where he needs to be, is still one of the best junglers in the region. There's just nobody else on this team that I trust. Evie has moments where he looks good, but he also has games like this where it's just not very impactful on the Gwen. And then I think Ruby, Jack Spectra, and Mercer is probably the weakest bot side of the map in the LEC. It's just not very good. Ruby's going to get done of the game here. Gets counterpicked with the Malphite in the mid lane. It's going to happen every once in a while, but at the very least, you need to know how to be kind of useful on the Jace, and there was just no usefulness to be had here in the mid lane. Mursa was also really bad this game. I like Mursa as a player. I think on a better team, he would perhaps look a little bit better, especially if he had the opportunity to roam around on some of these engagers, but this Rakan game was just not very good. Heavily outplayed after that really bad trade in the early game. That bot lane fell behind, and then Hans was just able to take over, and so... Not really a good showing from Mursa. Jack Spectra might be the worst AD carry in the region. The big shock to me was you had Heretics on blue side, and they left the Draven up, and they didn't take it. That's Jack Spectra's best champion. I figured if you were going to leave the Draven up, that you were going to be the one to try and take that pick, but you don't end up taking it. You give it over to G2, and you get obliterated by it. Not really sure what the thought process was here. Zaya's okay into Draven, but again... Hans plays Draven differently than just your average Draven. This bot side of the map gives me no confidence that Heretics is going to outplay any of the expectations that I had for them. They were really bad in this game, both mentality-wise and mechanic-wise. 
Outside of Yankos, I just don't really see a lot of talent on this team. Evi, sometimes here or there, but again, bot side scares me. Heretics would not surprise me at all to be one of those teams that ends the season in the bottom two. And uh, honestly, if I had to predict, I would probably predict, especially with Excel, you know, kind of jumping up, uh, beating Fnatic earlier today. Heretics is probably one of those teams I'm looking at to hit that bottom two. As for G2, good win. Really, really good to see. Obviously, you know, they're, they've never been a team that really relies on regular season results too much. They're going to lose games here or there just because they try shit like this. They play Malphite mid with like Gragas top and then go all in on Draven and sometimes it doesn't work, right? But they're just so mechanically talented and they can play pretty much anything that you need them to. They're so flexible. G2 is never going to be one of those teams that I'm completely out on. They are really, really dominant when they're playing well and this was just another example of that. Moving now into day number two of LEC week number one in the spring. And we kicked off day number two, battle of two teams that lost on day number one, but two teams that are really, really solid coming off of big overachieving splits. We had Mad Lions taking on Team BDS. And BDS picks up the win, dropping Mad to 0-2, but BDS a respectable 1-1, one one, especially with the strength of schedule that they've had to go through in week number one here. Really good game from BDS. Really excited to see them show up and kind of play their game a little bit more. Obviously, game number one was kind of interesting for them when it came to SK. Their draft was very eclectic. They were relying a lot on Adam, on that Yasuo, and he just didn't get ahead. The Aphelios wasn't really all that good for this team, and now we're seeing that kind of flip over to Mad Lions, and spoiler alert, I'll, I've t I'll talk about this a bit later, but Aphelios is just not a pick, quite frankly, that LEC bot laners play all that well. They are much too aggressive and much too willing to fight to play something like Aphelios, who just needs time to scale up, and, and he needs to be a little bit more passive until you hit those 5v5 late games. That's not really what LEC teams like to do, and so I wouldn't recommend a lot of teams keep playing him, but BDS really able to take advantage of that one especially in the bot lane, because a really awesome bot lane performance coming out here from Crowny, who's going to get my player of the game. I know I gave him done of the game in game number one, but that was mostly just because it felt like he wasn't really playing Aphelios in the way that, you know, was conducive to winning. He was stepping up a bit too much, getting caught out just a tad too much for my liking. This is the kind of champion that I think he really thrives on. It can, you know, play on the edge of danger, but also you know, keep itself peeled. You can, you can do your own thing here. Obviously, you've got a Lulu with you. LeBron played awesome this game. We'll get to him in a bit, but Crowny was really in his element on the Zeri this game and definitely deserved the player of the game. He was 1v9ing a lot of the team fights towards the back half of the game. Anybody who watches the channel knows I'm pretty high on Crowny. I was really high on him back in like the SK gaming days before he even went to Team Vitality, and then obviously everything on Vitality happened, and he ends up not having a spot for a little while. He ends up getting another chance here on BDS, and he absolutely proved it, you know, a good choice to bring him back up in winter. He was really, really good. He got on my all-pro teams. He's my third team all-pro in winter for uh, the LEC just in general, and I think he definitely proved that he deserves to be near the top of the rankings in this league in terms of AD carries, and he's doing it again here. When he's given the opportunity to be this mobile, this more mobile carry, somebody who can play on the edge of danger, somebody who can show off some of his mechanics without having to worry so much about some of the positioning errors that maybe he accomplishes by being a little bit over aggressive, he really looks like one of the best ADs in the entire region. This Zeri pick, I think in particular, has been an absolute marvel for him. Things like the Lucian have also been really, really good for Crowny, and so those are the champions that I want to see him play a little bit more. He showed why in this game. It was really solid. And then Lebrov on the other side of this matchup, um, not the other side, the uh, in, in the same bot lane, I guess, but he was awesome on the Lulu. Well, Brav has honestly been really underrated over the course of the last split or so. We've been talking about Crowny and how good he's been as an AD carry, and, and, and trust me, he deserves to get credit for it, but Lebrov has been one of the best supports in the region all year long in 2023. That's not particularly surprising to those who have watched Lebrov for mo multiple years, I should say, because he's been a really good support in the past. It was just that one year with Karzi on Vitality that didn't necessarily work out, and his his stock definitely plummeted from that, but getting on a BDS team that had something to prove, obviously, connecting really well with a bot laner that he's played with at the LEC level before, all of this was a nice recipe for Lebrov to kind of rebuild his image, get back to the form that he was, which was like a top three or four support. There's a reason that when Vitality was building a super team last year, they felt comfortable to keep Lebrov on the team, and that's because he was their best player for many, many years before that super team was formed, so good to see Crowny and Lebrov kind of get back to their form. They are one of the most dangerous bot lanes in the entire region, and that's a really, really good thing to say for BDS. And then, of course, Adam was also really good in this game. He gets his signature Darius, probably the pick that most people associate with him. That and Olaf are definitely the two that come to mind for Adam, but Darius especially. That's Adam's pick, and he was able to play it into the Fiora. This is a really good matchup 
for the Darius. It's actually really difficult for the Fiora to do a lot here in the 1v1 because you can't really repost anything, especially if he has ult up. You basically have to repost the W if you get hit by that and it applies the bleed stacks, then you're in a really bad spot. But you can't really repost the E. I mean, you can, but then he's still just going to be able to do it again before you're able to repost again. And you can't repost the ult because if he hits E right into ultimate, you don't have time. You're buffered, so you, you're you you're stunned, and so you don't have time to press E. It's a really difficult matchup for the free order to play, and I think Adam knew that. He knew this matchup inside and out, and he did a really good job pressuring up on the top side. Was a little bit caught out for some of his over-aggression at points in the game, but almost all of those deaths were worth it. And so, big credit to Adam. I thought he was great. Shao did a phenomenal job of enabling Adam. There were a ton of 2v2s up on the top side that went BDS's way, and that was a big reason why they were able to generate an early lead. And then Nuke just did his job as kind of that secondary carry in the mid lane. I would say Adam and Crowny were definitely the standouts, but Lebrov and Shao definitely deserve just as much credit for enabling the team to look as good as they did. Then for Mad Lions on the other side, not exactly how you wanted to start your split after going to finals. You don't really want to start at 0-2. I hear a lot of conversation surrounding this team about how they're basically locked in for MSI as if that's somehow true. It's not. Um, like, I, I don't know where this narrative has come from. Yes, they have the most championship points of teams outside of G2. And if G2 wins the split, you know, there's a chance Mad Lions goes to MSI based on championship points. But you have to remember, if, if Mad Lions at all finishes below Koi, Koi's going to MSI over Mad. Like, the difference is not that big and so um i don't really understand this narrative that mad has like an msi spot locked so they can take it easy it's just not really the reality of the situation they're just playing bad right now and um there's really not a lot to say about you know good stuff that came out of this game niski wasn't a disaster in the mid lane that was really the only lane that was serviceable for mad lions top side i already talked about being a miserable matchup for the fiora but elioya tried his best to try to salvage it and ended up just giving the darius more gold in the end elioya is going to get my dud of the game because of that a really really bad game coming out from a really good jungler obviously he's going to have some ups and downs but this was one of the bigger downs of the year for elioya i really like him i still think you know, he's probably the best jungler in EU, but this was a pretty bad performance. And speaking of bad performances, Hillisang was bad again. That's two games in a row now that he was just not very good. That Thresh pick is just not working out for Mad Lions. Obviously, I've already talked a bit about the Aphelios not really being something that I'd like to see pulled out by LEC teams, but especially someone like Karzi, who really likes to generate those early leads, is, you know, someone who wants to play a little bit more for strong side, or at the very least, an isolated 2v2. And that's just not really what's going to happen when you play for Aphelios. You're going to have to take it a lot more easy in the early game, even into something like Zeri that you typically can pressure out. And so... You know, Hillisang playing on the Thresh and being over-aggressive and getting punished by Crowny and Lebrov. Not particularly surprising, but it's just one of those, Mad's going to play this really aggressive style bot lane, and when it doesn't work out, they're going to look bad. And Hillisang just kind of was the recipient of that in this game. But Elioya, Hillisang, definitely the two players that I think were the worst. Karzi didn't have a great game, but, you know, I think he's going to get a little bit more blame than maybe he should. And Chasey kind of got destroyed in a matchup that's pretty unplayable in the top lane. Overall, Mad just didn't look all that good, and that's the second game of the season that they've already not looked all that good. I have faith that this team has enough talent to turn it around, but this certainly is not how they envisioned to their year to start or their split to start. As for BDS on the other side, really solid win here. It's a nice bounce back from a loss to SK. I think your bot lane is really solid. I'm not sure how they're going to fare going up against some of the best in the entire league, as we saw last game against SK, but they are good. They are more than serviceable enough to get you close to top four. It's all just going to be about how the rest of this team ends up stepping up. Adam looked good in this game. Shale looked good in this game. If those two can continue to grow and become a really nice duo on the top side of the map with how consistently good this bot lane has been, BDS is a team that absolutely can contend for top four, and I think they proved that again in this game. Then moving on to our second game of day number two here. And this is an incredibly interesting one. Top team versus bottom team in terms of the standings last split. But both teams are definitely looking a little bit different. We had Excel taking on Team Vitality. And Vitality do pick up the win. And it's pretty dominant in the way that they picked up the win as well. A 22-4 win is certainly a little bit of a blowout. I do want to give a little bit of credit to Excel before we jump into Vitality here. I think last split, you would look at the time, you would look at the score, you would look at the players' individual scores, and you'd be like... Oh, Excel just getting run over, having no idea what to do on the map. That really wasn't the case this game. Vitality had a fantastic early game, and Excel really didn't go down, like, dying. They didn't just roll over and die. They snuck a Baron midway through this game with a really good macro call. And just generally speaking, it looked like they were at least trying to do stuff in the mid to late game, 
even when they were super far behind, which is already so much of an improvement on what they were offering in winter of this year. But let's talk about Vitality because this team is just unstoppable mechanics-wise when they are playing teams that they are better than. And that was the case here. There are so many people on this team that could have gotten player of the game. I'm going to give it to Upset, first of all, because it's Upset and he's playing so well right now. And I'm so sorry to my Fnatic fans out there. But also, he deserved it. His positioning in this game was second to none. His ability to deal damage at a consistent rate on a champion like Zaya that we're seeing picked incredibly commonly throughout the LEC. Not just the LEC, but throughout pretty much every region. It's just super impressive stuff. He is one of the most talented AD carries in the region, and it's not really all that close. There's a reason that I had him as my number one ADC going into Spring Split here, and it's because when he's on, like if he's playing at his top level, he is the best ADC. It doesn't matter how well Exekick's playing. It doesn't really matter how well Han Sama's playing. I would take upset over both of them in his best moments, and he's really had his best moments to start the year. Now, obviously, it's going to take more than just a couple of games in order for me to solidify my opinion on upset, but... To start off the year, it's about as good as he could possibly look. Another really, really good game from him here. Him and Kaiser seem to have great chemistry together in the early 2v2. They love taking some of these aggressive trades, and they're really good at winning them. Limit really didn't have a lot of positives in this game. Obviously, maybe the shot calling uh, could have been a positive. We know that he's brought in, essentially, to be a main shot caller for the team, but... That laning phase was brutal for the Heimerdinger and Upset and Kaiser did a great job taking advantage of it. It seems like these two are going to work together well and hopefully that continues over the course of the split because both of these players are ridiculously talented. If they can form a duo together and, and play together at a high level, that's going to be huge for Vitality. Of course, they weren't the only two to play at a high level in this game. Big shout out to the top laner, Photon. I got actually some pushback calling him my MVP for Winter Split. Don't really know why. Again, it's a regular season award, and I don't know how you can justify giving anybody else that regular season MVP than Photon last split. He was just the most dominant player in his role by such a large margin. He pulls out the Jace here, and he obliterates Odoamne, who is a good player. Like, again, I don't want to take anything away from Odoamne. He was really good in their opening game, and then he gets absolutely wrecked by the Jace in this one. A huge top gap, a pretty big bot gap as well, and then Perks and Bo were also really solid. Perks was super good on the Annie being able to find picks in the mid game and set up a lot, especially for that Zaya. And then Bo on the Sejuani, he plays it so aggro and he generates so much tempo for Vitality that it really is up to Excel to force plays in order for them to have anything on the maps. Yes, some of the timings weren't perfect for Vitality, but at the end of the day, this team is so talented and so good that I have a feeling they're going to be fine. This is a great example of what this team can look like at its best. But we've seen a good Vitality team in the first couple weeks before. It's really going to be about the consistency for the rest of the split when it comes to this roster. Then for Excel on the other side, like I said, it wasn't a great game, but at the very least, they didn't get like utterly destroyed. Like they didn't give up midway through the game, which I think they did a lot last split. My dud of the game is going to go to Odoamne. He got absolutely demolished in that top lane matchup. That Jace was so strong and that Renekton was so useless in this game. Obviously, I'm not super out on Odoamne as a player or anything like that. But this just wasn't his best performance, and I don't think anybody's really going to be arguing with that. When top kind of gets destroyed like this, it's a bit of a problem in the LEC, because typically you just want your top lanes to go relatively even. You want to give more agency to some of these stronger champions, quite frankly, in the bot side of the map. Things like the Casio, even the Caitlyn Heimerdinger, you want to give Pryo to them, and when top, lanes when top lane is losing so hard, it just creates a, a point of pressure, I would say, for the other team that you really have no way of matching, but... Overall, still think Odo's a good player, just a really bad game going up against a really talented top laner. And then Patrick and Limit, you gotta win this early lane. Like, you can't pick Caitlyn Heimer and get completely shoved out. And that's kind of what happened here. I don't think Patrick played particularly bad. His positioning was good, but Limit was just not good in this one. Again, some of the intangibles that he brings to the table are probably not recognizable just by watching the games, but... Mechanically speaking, this was not a very good performance from the Heimerdinger. You're getting completely abused by the uh, the Rakan. Uh, sorry, I couldn't say Rakan without saying Renekton, I guess. And also the Zaya. Uh, pa Upset's positioning was really, really good, but you got to be able to win this lane, and that's something Excel has struggled with all year long, is winning through the bot lane. Hopefully, their early games are going to get a little bit better. That's the part that I had the most faith would improve for Excel, if only just because these players are genuinely talented, and if they get some confidence behind them, hopefully they'll get back to being able to be competent in lanes. Unfortunately, that wasn't going to happen against a really good team like Vitality. I still have faith in a team like Excel to be able to pull themselves out of it. They're only at 1-1, to -one and they face one of the best teams in the league, but this team is not completely fixed from all their problems in winter overnight. They still have a lot of work to do. And then for Vitality on the other side, 
Maybe this team is fixed. I mean, they looked incredibly good in this game, and I'm just hoping that they're going to be able to keep it up. They are incredibly scary when they're playing the best league that they possibly can. Again, Upset and Kaiser look like they're playing at a high level. Perks, Bo, Photon have all started off the season looking really hot. There's a real good chance that the Vitality is the best team in the LEC. Obviously, I'm not going to just give them that title. They're going to have to earn it, but they are proving just about as much as they possibly can at the beginning part of this split. Then moving on to our third game of day number two, another interesting one, a clash of organizations that have had their fair share of fun games in the past. We have Fnatic taking on SK Gaming, and SK picks up the win here in this one. Maybe a surprise for some people, but not a surprise for me, and I don't think a surprise for a lot of other people either. Uh, I think SK has really proven themselves to be a genuinely good team, one of the better teams in the LEC right now. And Fnatic is just not on that level. They might be the single worst team in the LEC at the moment. Let's talk about SK first because I know a lot of the conversation about this game is going to be around Fnatic because that's just how Fnatic is right now. But I think SK definitely deserves to get some of the credit for actually going out there and winning the game. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Player of the game was really easy for me in this one. It's going to go to Sirtis in the mid lane on the Talia. And it's not just for the performance, although it is mostly for the performance, right? Like, obviously, he was the best player on SK. If he wasn't, I wouldn't give him player of the game. But the narrative that I want to start around Sirtis is the growth and the improvement and just the general ability that he has grown into as an LEC mid laner. There are a lot of mid laners in the LEC that I would consider really good players. Sirtis has really, really made a case to be in that category by this point in the year. He has been fantastic for this SK gaming team, and the thing that really gives me a lot of confidence to say that is he played Talia in this game and was just as devastating and difficult to deal with on the map as he was on his signature Akali in the previous game. That just wasn't something that he was doing in previous years. He was really good at the Assassins, really good at the melee mids, you know, the LeBlancs, the Akalis, the Yones. That's what Sirtis had always been more successful on as a player. To see him be able to pull out something like a Talia and dominate in the same fashion, yes, it's against a team that is really struggling right now. But this gives me so much confidence that the growth that he has gone through over the past year or so is real and it's sustainable. And that's really the part that matters. Sirtis has become one of the more intriguing and explosive mid laners in Europe in, you know, full stop. And I, for one, am really here for it. I was calling for a breakout this year for Sirtis. He's a player that I've liked ever since last year. I was kind of low on him when he came into the LEC, but... I really like the way that he played for an SK gaming team that really was kind of meh for most of 2022. It's good to see him get retained, and it's good to see him continue to grow with a team that is genuinely good around him. Him and Marcoon in particular have really good chemistry as a mid-jungle duo, and I'm just hoping that that continues to grow as well. Irrelevant was awesome in this game on the Renekton. He continues to look really good as a late-game player. Obviously, his laning stats are still pretty solid, but when you think about Irrelevant, you think about someone who is hyper-consistent when it comes to the team fight stage of the game, and that's what you got here. Exekick and Doss were still fantastic, outside of the one random moment where Exekick just, like, died for no reason um, <laughs> into Fnatic. Um... I would say that they had a really, really fantastic game. Doss maybe overextended a tad bit too much, but topside was more than there to make up for it. I thought the Vitalia combo was really difficult for Fnatic to actually deal with, and Irrelevant is genuinely one of the best performing top laners in the entire region right now. Really, really fun to watch this SK team. When they're getting carried by their topside and their bot side was first team all pro last year, I mean, that or last split, I should say, that is a recipe for a team that, you know, re very, very realistically could make top four. I mean, they are very likely a top four team in the LEC right now, and that's just absolutely huge for a team like SK Gaming. And then for Fnatic on the other side, the team that people probably want to hear about a little bit more, the problems are real, and they are easy to spot. The solo laners are in particular in this game were just bad. A lot of people are going to give dud of the game to Oscar Rinnan, and while I understand, and trust me, he played like a dud of the game, like in, in most games he would get it, I would be remiss not to give it to Humanoid in this one. This was the stereotypical Humanoid experience. It was kind of dying early, giving away a bit of gold to the other side, and then just playing so ridiculously invisibly over the next, you know, 30 or whatever minutes of the game and just doing nothing and losing, right? Rolling over and dying. Oh, I shouldn't say he did nothing. Of course, it's worth pointing out that he used his ultimate in the final team fight to ult Renekton directly on top of his AD carry, who had all the gold on the team, and then instantly kill him. <laughs> um, that was certainly something that he did, but... God, I don't know what is going on with Humanoid. He has been really, really bad for this team. Again, I, I can't stress this enough. 
It was like 25 minutes of absolute nothing, like farming and like zero damage coming out from Humanoid. Just like, okay, well, maybe he gets online with the Azir eventually. You've got the Zeri, you've got the Gangplank, maybe they can team fight, but you do eventually have to do something in the game. And then by the time Humanoid decides to pull the trigger on that something, that something is literally killing his AD carry. And so I don't really know, like Humanoid to me deserves player of the game. I think he was more irrelevant this game than Oscar Rinnan. Yes, Oscar died more and was maybe a little bit of a bigger problem, but at least he did damage. Like at least he was trying to play the game. Felt like Humanoid has completely given up on attempting to play League of Legends at a high level. That's what it felt like in this game. I, I don't really even know how to explain it. Oscar was bad and he got destroyed by irrelevant in lane and I'll say this like Oscar does not look ready to play at the LEC level he's playing some of the picks that he was most successful on in the Superliga but it's just not translating really at all right now and it's just frustrating to watch if these solo laners are going to be playing like this it's not going to go all that well for Fnatic Razork had another pretty poor game although I do think he made some good plays I also think he canceled those out with a little bit of bad ultimates and then there's Reckless. Poor Reckless, I thought was actually pretty good in this game. He got ahead on the Zeri. He actually had gold and he was ready to team fight. And then nothing. Uh, Renekton gets ulted on top of him. He instantly dies. If that was me, I'm literally, I'm reporting humanoid. Like I am, I'm going into the client. I don't know if you can report on tournament client, but if you can, I'm reporting my mid laner and I'm, I'm reporting him for inting because what was that? Um, I feel bad for Reckless and Advian. They're still going to get a lot of the blame for this, even though they absolutely don't deserve it. They were fine, especially in comparison to what the top side of the map did. But Fnatic is bad. Like, there really is no other way to put it. They very well could be the worst team in the LEC. And I know Fnatic fans don't want to hear that, but I kind of predicted it. Like, again, go back to my preseason predictions. I had more faith in Excel. I know I put them lower in the power rankings, but I talked about them in the sections, saying that if either team was going to break out, it was probably going to be Excel. And that, honestly, Fnatic came in pretty low, even in my true talent rankings. And that's kind of coming through right now. They just don't really seem to have the talent or the cohesion or the macro to be able to hang with upper tier LEC teams. And that's just the opposite of what this organization should be reaching for in 2023. And then for SK, they are a top tier team. I I'm tired of waiting. Uh, I think they're there. Um, I know I've been a little bit hesitant to kind of pull the trigger on them. Maybe more hesitant than some of the other people in the community, but... I'm pulling the trigger now. They are really, really good, and they are definitely, at the moment, a top four team in the LEC. I'm just hoping that they can even continue to grow. A player like Exekick and Doss, like, they could continue to get better. Certus could continue to get better. If these guys reach, like, number one in their role across the board, like, there's a real possibility SK, by the end of the year, could turn into, like, a world's team, and you know, like, an MSI representative. Like, there is not, it's not out of the realm of the possibilities for this team to be a top two team in the LEC, and... Honestly, that is about as good of a possibility as you could create for SK Gaming, especially with what their predictions were at the beginning of the year. And then moving on to our fourth game of day number two here. And this one was another little bit of an upset, but it is two teams that won on day one. We had G2 Esports taking on Astralis. And Astralis picks up a really big win here, actually taking down G2, our defending champions, are given their first loss of the split by a streaking Astralis team. Remember, they got better as the split went on over the back of winter. They were really bad at the start of the split. It looked like they were a shoe in for bottom two. And then they played really well in the final week of the season. I believe they went two and one or three and zero, something like that to secure their spot into the top eight. And then they just barely didn't make it out. Uh, ending up getting beaten by the eventual runners-up to the winter split in Mad Lions in the group stage. And so Astralis actually really improved a lot, and they only upgraded clearly by bringing in a new mid laner because Leader is going to be getting my player of the game here in their second game of the split on his signature Aurelia. Honestly, a little bit BM by G2 to leave that up. There's a reason that basically every single team that he's been on has had that permanently banned against them because he's really freaking good at Aurelia. That's his champion. G2 leaves it up, and honestly, I don't even hate the response to this. If you're going to leave up Aurelia when Renekton and Zaya are already picked, you might as well pick the Malphite, right? This full armor tank that's really good into AD carries that gets natural armor. Like, that's pretty good into something like a full AD comp. Unfortunately, what they didn't account for was Leader being really good at Aurelia, and that ended up being a little bit of a problem for G2 overall. Leader was awesome in this game. His scoreline doesn't even tell you the full picture. In these team fights, if they didn't fully put their attention on Aurelia, G2 that is, if G2 didn't put every single ability that they had onto peeling the Aurelia off of their backline, the fight was over. He would instantly kill Hansama in almost every single instance 
and there genuinely was almost nothing that G2 could do about it. That's the power of an incredibly strong Aurelia. I know the scoreline doesn't necessarily look dominant, but Leader had one of those games where it's like, oh, I get it. Like, this is why you have to ban that champion against that player, because when he gets it, he's going to be so useful, basically, no matter how much gold he has. That's not to take away from the fact that he did do well early. He was just targeted a lot in a lot of these team fights. It was Aurelia versus G2, and in some insane cases, Aurelia actually won that. And so, big ups to Leader. He's already shown that he is an upgrade to Dior, who was the worst mid laner in the LEC last split and had been, you know, over the course of the last year or so. And so, it's just good to get somebody in the building who you can play around at that position. It allows Kabe and Jonghoon to even be a little bit more aggressive in their own right because a lot of attention has to be shown to the Aurelia. That leaves the Zaya basically open to free farm the enemy backline. And boy, did Kabe do a lot of damage in this game. He played really well. Jonghoon was setting up plays really well, mostly for Kabe because Leader really didn't need a lot of setup this game. But adding on CC to everything that Aurelia already does is just almost unfair. So really, really good game coming out from Astralis. Leader Leader, Kabe, Jonghoon, definitely the carries, but 1-1-3 with another really solid performance on this Sejuani. He has continued to look like a more supportive, more consistent member of this team so far. And then Finn is just a good top laner. He's not going to be someone that dominates the scene or anything like that. But, you know, when the team is playing well, he's going to look good. And the team is playing well right now. So the streaky Finn looking good in that regard. Leader especially, though, definitely the standout. As for G2, though, on the other side, some positives this game. I do like their draft in concept. Again, Malphite into a full AD comp is a good idea, and, you know, obviously Caps has already shown this week that he can play the Malphite in the mid lane. Unfortunately, he didn't play it well enough to be able to stop the Aurelia. Um, the Malphite basically had to spend ult every single fight in order to keep the Aurelia off his backline, which is just such a waste of one of the best abilities in the entire game, and that's the reason that he's going to be getting my dud of the game here. It's not that he himself played particularly bad, but allowing that Aurelia to get ahead when you yourself are the counter to it, and then having to use your entire really good team fighting kit in order to neutralize that pick that needed to be neutralized earlier. It's just a feels bad moment, right? Especially when you're going a really aggressive build on Malphite. It wasn't AP or anything, but just building a little bit more, uh, I don't know, uh, greedily, like Sheen early again for Caps, then maybe you should. So overall, Caps is going to get it, but I don't even think he, it's not like he mechanically was bad or anything like that, or he made some major mistakes. He just allowed Irelia to get ahead and then eventually couldn't really stop her. And then he became kind of useless in the team fights because of it. Outside of that, you could say the same thing about Hansama, although I think Hans had a much better mid game than Caps did. Hans got a lot of gold on the Caitlyn. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to use any of it because he was instantly obliterated in every single fight by that Irelia pick. And so poor Hans really wasn't able to play the game. Mickey was also not really all that useful this game. I would say Caps, Mickey, definitely the options for dead of the game, but Broken Blade had some moments on the Kled. Yike had some moments on the Jarvan, but mostly G2 was just kind of behind in tempo. I know the score looks okay, but it really wasn't G2 kind of throwing any sort of lead or anything like that. It was Astralis really controlling the pacing of the game, playing around their carries, knowing exactly when they want to fight, having good engages and being able to capitalize on those engages that really got them the win, which is probably the most impressive thing I could possibly say about Astralis. For, to go up against a team like G2 and not win because the other team played bad, but genuinely just because you played at a really high level, that's just about the best thing you could possibly say. G2 is going to recover. Like I said earlier, they drop games in the regular season all the time. It's just what this team does. But this is a confidence-boosting win for a team like Astralis. If they can continue this momentum, they're going to be a lot better than the seventh place that I, you know, had them in my power rankings. I thought they might even be worse than that. There was a real chance that this team finished bottom two for me this split. That is looking like a bad call at this point because they are looking really, really fun to watch and really explosive as a team. And then to close out our day number two, we had a match between two teams that are trying to bounce back from a frustrating start to the season. We had Team Heretics taking on Koi, and Koi does pick up the win here, as they absolutely needed to. If they dropped their first two games of the year, that would have been a pretty bad look from a team that just finished in the top three in the last split. Again, a team that did struggle in the regular season, but they always got their shit together when it mattered the most, even as Rogue. Uh, to be fair, Rogue was really good in the regular season, but, you know, Koi, I'm going to give a little bit of leniency to, and this is why, because they when they want to show up, they can look pretty good. I do want to say, this did feel a bit like a 2v8 on the side of Heretics, a little bit more than maybe Koi, like, dominating the game, but there is one player that I have to give a massive shout-out to, and you already know who it is if you watch this game. It's Shigenda in the top lane. He was so good in this one. It's pretty crazy how narratives shift over time. It feels like I've become kind of a Shigenda, like... 
uh, defender, I guess, uh, over the past few weeks. I think that people have been really down on him as a player. People have looked at Koi's results with and without Odoamne, and they've just assumed that he's been the problem. But as I said a lot over the course of my winter analysis, Shigendo was not the problem with Koi in winter, and it really isn't. I, like, I don't know how you can see that as the issue. He was pretty good up on the top side. Maybe not a superstar. He's not carrying games, but Odoamne wasn't carrying games. And so really it was all just about Comp and Trimby underperforming as soon as they kind of got their shit together and started playing well again. The team started winning again. And Shigenda, I think, is a big part of that. But it's good to see him step up and really dominate a game on a very aggressive champion like Jace in this meta. I think that is a really good sign. Obviously, top lane, not really something that a lot of teams are playing for. A little bit more prevalent, I would say, in spring so far than it was in winter. We've had a couple of games where teams have been trying to invest a lot of their jungle pressure into the top side. Not exactly sure if that's going to last over the course of the season because teams just often don't like to do it, but I think Shigenda in this game is a great example of why you can pull it off. If you have a top laner that you know you can get ahead and that you know can do really well from ahead, then go ahead and give it to him. You know, EU Jace, LMAO. Well, it turns out EU Jace was pretty good in this game. Big credit to Shigenda. I think he's going to be one of the better top laners in the league. I don't know if it's going to be this year, but he's got a lot of mechanical talent. The team just needs to play for him a bit more. Um, speaking on the rest of the team, I actually think the rest of the team was pretty good. Um, I don't think they were great. I certainly think that Heretics had their moments, most specifically Yankos, who was awesome again in this game. But let's go ahead and talk about Larson in the mid lane, because that was definitely the other lane that I felt was definitely in favor of Koi was this mid lane matchup. Larson's just incredibly consistent. Again, there's not really a lot I can say about Larson that I haven't already said about him. The same narrative that I've been pitching over the past, what, two years when it comes to Larson is the same narrative that I will uphold today. He's an incredibly talented player, probably the most consistent mid laner in the LEC, but he can't be your primary carry, right? He's a very good player, though. When you have a player like Shigenda stepping up and dominating on the Jace, you can have a player like Larson be that secondary carry for your team, and he's going to look really good in that role. But if you need him to be that primary guy. It's just not something that he's super comfortable doing. I think, you know, having a team of really strong laners around him is a really big positive for Larson. And don't get me wrong, Larson makes Koi better because of the consistency that he offers in that mid lane as well. Comp and Trimby are still looking to find their footing a bit. The Lucianami just isn't hitting like it was in 2022. And then Malrang was fine. I thought he got out jungled in this game, but you know, he didn't necessarily make any massive mistakes. And so easy to give him at least a little bit of a pass. Shigendo really was the saving grace for Koi in this game. And without him, they probably don't win. Moving over to Heretics, though, because, uh, you know, maybe Heretics don't win this game even if Shigenda doesn't play well because, holy crap, some of these players played bad. Let's talk about the player who played well, Yankos. And I called it a 2v8. It wasn't necessarily a 1v9 because I do think Mursa had some really good plays, especially towards the back half of this game. And they're the two players on this team that I actually really like. Evie kind of impressed me in winter, but he had a miserable back half of this game. And, you know, just something to keep in mind. But Yankos was really good on the Wukong had to basically fight his teammates the entire game. Uh, we'll talk about one of the Ruby plays in a bit, but there were so many times where it felt like his teammates were actively trolling him and actively inting him. And, you know, you could see it on stage. He's wearing a mask. He, he's clearly sick. He's clearly got the fever first. I don't really want to be that guy, but probably don't play on stage if you're sick. You can play remotely and it should be fine. We've seen, you know, teams make that exception in the past. But if they are going to let you play, if you feel like you're good enough to play on stage, um, then play. And obviously it didn't affect his performance. He was really good this game, but... If I played this well when I had a fever and I still lost, I'd be so mad because Yankos was legitimately top tier in this game. Uh, I thought Mercer was really good. Some missteps, I would say, in the early game coming out from the Rakan, not exactly a perfect early game. But some of those flanks in the late game, if he had an actual team following up on them, would have been fantastic. And, and honestly, game winning in a circumstance where the game was as close as it was. Unfortunately, he did not have a team that was willing to follow up on a lot of his flanks and a lot of his engages. And so they were just really good engages. They didn't end up actually turning into anything. Definitely frustrating if you're a Yankos and Mercer fan, but... We got to talk about the solo laners because they were really the ones to let this team down. Most notably Ruby in the mid lane, who just had a horrendous game. There really is no excuse for his play on the rise. The one play that's going to come to everybody's mind when you're talking about Ruby this game is one of the Baron plays. There's like 8,000 Barons in this game, so it's one of them. I don't remember which one, but uh, where Yankos is actively trying to take Baron. Heretics is on Baron trying to take it. And Ruby risults right in the middle of the pit. And Yankos literally has to flash out of the pit or, like, out of the Rizolt in order to actually take Baron. It's like, what the hell is going on? Why is you, why is the Rise actively inting away his own team? Like, I just don't understand. Maybe he was trying to time it with the Baron being taken, but 
Whatever it was, it was not working. Overall, Heretics looked bad in this game. Abby looked awful in the back half. Trendemir can be a huge proponent, a huge big factor, especially when these games go to team fights. And he was just bad. He was just really not good. Shigenda outplayed him massively in this game. Evie and Ruby were definitely the two players that let Heretics down the most. But, I, you know, I'm not surprised. Ruby was somebody who I was low on after Winter Split. And now that Dior's out, he's got a pretty clear-cut case to be the worst mid laner in the LEC. Jack Spectra is not exactly lighting the world on fire, even if he's not making major mistakes. Evi really isn't being the same kind of late-game force that he was, even with Yankos playing really well. It's going to be hard for this Heretics team to win games if they play like this. And then for Koi, they're going to be happy and lucky to walk away with this win, but there are still a lot of things that this team can clean up. Right now, they feel good. They certainly don't feel like a team that is in the top four, which is not good to say, considering it's Koi. I, obviously, they've got plenty of time to turn it around, just like they did last split, but I have to call it how I see it. And right now, I see it as a team that's just kind of fine in the grand scheme of things. And that means we can now jump into our third and final day of LEC action here in week number one. And we kicked off the third and final day with a matchup between two teams that are undefeated heading into the final day of week one. And that is SK Gaming and Astralis. One of these teams is going to be walking out 3-0 and oh, and that team is SK Gaming. They continue to look incredibly good like they have all week long up until this point, but this one might be the most dominant game that they have played in 2023 Spring Split so far. A fun game, but a stomp nonetheless for SK. And this is Marcoon's game, baby. This is the one that really puts Marcoon on the map. I've been high on Marcoon for such a long time. Anybody who follows the channel knows I was almost annoyingly high on him last year for Excel when I was talking about how that team was outperforming a lot of the expectations. I was so low on Mickey X. I really wasn't into what Nuke Duck was doing in the mid lane. And I was like, dude, Marcoon's so good. He's dragging this team to playoffs. And here he is on an SK gaming team where he has support around him. And look at them now. They are a true contender in the LEC. And Marcoon is a big part of that. There is this vocal contingent of people on Reddit, on Twitter, who even in a game like this will look at it and go, well, Doss was really good. He was setting up everything. Marcoon didn't even play that well. Doss was freaking awesome. I'm not going to take that away. Trust me, I'll get into that. But why does it have to be a competition like that? Why can't Marcoon and Doss both be really good players? Like, why can't they just help each other be better? Marcoon's really good, and I'm tired of the slander. He's an incredibly strong jungler and one that definitely deserves to be talked about in the upper echelon of LEC junglers. Player of the game for sure. Doss was also super good. Again, it's not a competition between these two. They're on the same team for a reason. Marcoon had a great, great early game capitalizing on a lot of the things that Doss created for him. And Doss did a great job creating opportunities for Marcoon to capitalize on. Both of those things are true. It was a really big support gap in this game. Not only in the 2v2 bot lane, which was just won by SK, but Doss was out everywhere on the map, moving along with this lease and creating action, most notably in the mid lane. But I mean, they were, to pick, they were picking a lot on the pike. They were picking on the Vi. Obviously, the Silas. Like, there just wasn't a lot of safe spaces with the Lee Sin Rakan being the double engage here. And it's honestly just a really enlightening and fun thing to watch. Two players who are just super active, super aggro, and super macro-oriented just dominate the map. They were easily the two best players for SK in this game, and that's super impressive. Again, I've been high on Marcoon, but to see Doss like really succeed outside of the 2v2 laning phase, that's where I really want to see him start growing. He was really good in the 2v2 in winter, but a lot of that it's hard not to attribute to Exekick just being the best or one of the best AD carries in the region. To see Doss get out on the map, be super aggro, and work really well with his jungler gives me a lot of confidence that he would be able to do this with or without a top tier ADC with him in that lane. And so just a lot of positives, really no negatives to say about SK Gaming after this one. Exekick, Certus, Irrelevant, who was awesome in the top lane in this game. There's just no negatives. They have been so good to start the year. As for Astralis on the other side, you know, it's a loss. You know, going 2-1 and one is certainly not a bad start to the year. In fact, I think almost every single Astralis fan will take a 2-1 and one start. You would have liked to have put up a fight against this SK Gaming team, but they're just a little bit out of your pay grade. It would seem the bot lane, unfortunately, the lane that has kind of dominated over the course of the year so far just couldn't hold up. Jong-un gets his signature pike here, and he had a pike game that is maybe not as good as some of his best ones. It just... He got completely support gapped in this game by Rakan. That combo of Vigar Pike can be pretty deadly if used in the right combination. The problem is that they never really did it right. Like, you can hook, you can Pike Q into the Vigar Cage, and you can basically guarantee the stun every time. And that's a huge, huge combo that you can pull off on basically anybody in the laning phase. 
It just didn't seem like they had the synergy to pull that off, which is crazy because I would argue that Kobe and Jung-Hoon are two of the bot laners with the most synergy in the league right now, or at least that's what they've shown over the past few years and so, or last year or so, I should say, but I don't really know. It just wasn't their game. Jong-Hoon's going to get done of the game for it. The pike was just not very good. He was running it down, getting caught out by the Rakan, being a target for the Lee Sim, wasn't really getting any executes, wasn't really dealing any damage, and when the pike is useless, that kind of makes, you know, the rest of the game really, really difficult. I also don't really like the idea of going Silas in the mid lane here. This is where it starts to get a little concerning with Leader's Champion Pool. Obviously, we know he's a lot better with melee mids, but Silas, in my opinion, was just not the pick in this game. You already have an AP bot, and Jax is doing AP damage. Like, I, I don't really understand why you're going Silas in this circumstance. Even if you do want to go melee, I feel like an AD melee mid would have just been better here. I know Aurelia was off the board, but you had options like Yone still left up that I think would have been a little bit more you know, emphatic in this game, and I think the Silas was absolutely not good for them. Leader was also in the running for dead of the game. I would say Jonghoon and Leader were definitely the two players that stood out for getting caught out the most. I don't think 1-1-3 had a particularly good game, but it wasn't bad either. He was still making plays. He just wasn't as good as Marcoon. And then Finn lost the top lane matchup. Kabe couldn't really do anything on the Vigar. These games are going to happen every once in a while. I'm not going to blame them entirely on Astralis, but Still, you're walking out of this week 2-1. That's going to be a positive turnabout, especially considering what expectations were for this team. Still like Astralis overall, just maybe not the end of the week that they could have asked for. And then SK Gaming, like, they're just so good. This team has proven to be one of the elite teams in the LEC, and I'm going to treat them as such until they prove me otherwise. Not only have they beaten basically every top team in the region at this point, at some point in 2023, but they've done it in, like, convincing fashion. They beat teams that they should. They beat the good teams. They made top four in, in winter. This is a great team, and I'm really, really happy to say that because I love the players on it. Really happy to see them all performing up to expectations. Moving on to our second game of day number three. And game number two is a little bit of a change of pace from game number one. They were two really good teams that were kind of in a little bit of a blowout in that first one. These are two teams that, you know, definitely have some bright spots, but aren't nearly on the same highs as the others. Uh, and it was actually really close. We had Team BDS taking on Team Heretics. And BDS does pick up the win. That means Heretics go 0 and 3 in their first week. BDS, a respectable 2 and 1, a very good record to start the year for a team that honestly has just continuously improved basically every single game that they've played. They've become a legitimate team here in the LEC, and it's been really, really fun to watch. So let's talk about them first, because they're the ones who walked out of this with a win. How can I talk about this game without talking about the level one, or just the, the, the first couple levels of the game in general? The biggest cheese play of all time. If you haven't seen it, go watch the first five minutes of this game. Please go watch it. Because me explaining it is not going to do it justice for what it was. If you have seen the game, you know what I'm talking about. BDS four mans bot lane level one with top lane, with their Scion. It ends up not working out. They get the teleport in from Evie. Adam tries to teleport out. Mercy interrupts with the Thresh hook. And you would think they would just be able to pick him off. And you're right, they do eventually get him, but not before Sheo and Nuke go super heavy on Ruby in the mid lane to actually pick up first blood for BDS. Adam dies in the bot lane, which is okay, but he actually picks up a kill on Merso while he does that. So it's a two for one at level one. And then Adam continues to be a nuisance. We end up hitting this point around eight minutes into the game where Evie is level six on the Gragas and Adam's level two because he's just not been in lane. He's not playing top lane. It doesn't matter. Adam completely runs around and ruins this game, but somehow it works. Like he is super useful. He's adding a champion that they normally wouldn't have in a lot of these areas. Yes, he is sacrificing any potential for himself to scale at all into the late game, but he was so useful over the first 10 minutes of the game. It's astounding that they would pull this off on stage, like in a real LEC game, but it's kind of insane that it actually worked. You could see the pain in Yankos' eyes when he was watching that game where it's just like, what the hell do I do about this now? Like, top lane's winning, like they're up, he's up a thousand gold, but like, what does it matter? Adam's everywhere on the map. Everyone else is winning because Adam's created these advantages elsewhere on the map. This is just a crazy thing to have happen, and BDS did a great job capitalizing on it. Crownie's gonna get my player of the game here, though. Kinda wanted to give it to Adam. I mean, it's, it's pretty insane. Adam was simultaneously both a candidate for player of the game and dud of the game in the same sentence. It's hard to not be, you know, considered for dud of the game when you're down four levels in, like, 2k gold at 10 minutes. But it's also not hard not to be considered player of the game when your contributions pretty directly influence your team winning the game. So... 
I'm gonna give it to Crowny just to kind of stay somewhere in the middle. Crowny was really good, especially towards the back half of this game when they were trying to close it out. Heretics actually did a good job rebounding. They used their gold rather wisely. Jack actually got pretty strong on the Aphelios in this game. And it was a little bit of an ADC trade. Unlucky for Heretics that... Uh, Crowny is just better than Jack Spectra, unfortunately, and so Crowny coming in looking really, really good. He was either player of the game or dead of the game in every single game that BDS played this week, and that's about right. Like, he's going to be the main carry for this team throughout the rest of the year. Lebrov did a great job facilitating him in this game, especially on the Recon. You know how high I am on Lebrov. I've already talked about it a bunch this week, but Adam creating that extra little spice for this team, that really is the difference. That's what separates BDS from all the other teams of just being kind of average, right? Is they have a top laner who can actively win you the game in any kind of way, no matter how crazy it may seem. sheo has been really good to start the year. Nuke did everything he needed to do in the mid lane to scale into the late game as that victor. BDS just knew their win condition and played to it super well. This was a great game from them. As for Heretics on the other side... Not a great game from them. Again, they tried their best here. They got cheesed at level 1. They end up going down in gold because of it. Evie does not go down in gold. He's super far up in gold. The problem is just the fact that he's not doing anything with the gold on the Gragas. Yes, you have that gold lead, but if Adam is making plays and you're just generating gold, the gold actually has to do something on the map for it to be useful at all. Yankos played really well again in this game, keeping heretics alive, controlling objectives, enabling plays on the Wukong, but he doesn't really have anybody to capitalize. I thought this was probably Jack Spectra's best game of the year. Mercer generally has been fine for Heretics. He's definitely been their second best player across uh, Spring Split so far, but Ruby just continues to be such a massive issue on this Azir. He's going to get my dud of the game. He just has no pressure. Again, he's pushed up way too far at the beginning. He ends up giving over first blood in a situation where that absolutely in no biz has no business going over to the side of BDS. And then from that point onwards, he's just kind of irrelevant on this Azir. He's not really doing damage. He's not really out farming nuke. It's just kind of a meh performance. Both the solo laners, you really needed to see a lot more out of when it came to Heretics, and that's just been the story of them across the year so far. Evi actually had a pretty good winter split, but Ruby, I think, has made a really solid case to be the worst mid laner in the LEC right now, and he's definitely backed that up with his performances in week one of spring here. I still think he's got talent. I still think he's got potential, but it's really, really not working out right now, not to mention the fact that Jack Spectra, while he is a good player, is certainly not good enough to put all your eggs in the basket of, at least at the moment. It's very frustrating that the two best players on this team are the more supportive types of players, and that means that I, I really worry about this team's win total coming in the rest of the year. But as for BDS on the other side, really, really solid win from them. Crazy strategy that ends up working out. Bot lane is really good. This team has a really good idea of how to play around the crazy tactics because they are the ones that influence them a lot. Adam's just one of those players. He's either going to win you or lose you a lot of games. Luckily for BDS right now, it seems to be that he's going to be winning them a lot of games, and that genuinely makes them a dangerous team no matter who they are facing this year. And then moving on to our third game of day number three here, and it's a rematch from the semifinals in the playoffs of winter. We had Koi taking on Mad Lions, neither really having the week that they wanted to up until this point, but it is the same result as in the playoffs as Mad Lions is able to take the game here from Koi, and they do it in good fashion. This was a Mad-dominated game. They definitely felt like the better team. It was a little bit slow, which typically I would say favors Koi, but in this game, it definitely favored Mad, and it definitely favored El Yoya in the jungle matchup. Of course, Malrang... One of those junglers that really likes to influence his lanes before he likes to get ahead himself. Kind of the opposite of Xerxe if you want a comparison, but that's not really working out right now. Obviously, with the jungle changes that I believe are live on this patch, it's just not going to be a viable strategy for a team like Koi. So they have to resort to some other things. They go for the Draven. They go for their Soraka that they pulled out a ton of times. Things like the Silas in the mid lane. Jace, you're trying to get your damage elsewhere. Unfortunately, you're just not able to get that Draven snowballed out of control. I always talk about how Draven games are Draven games. Mad Lions really played it a lot better, if we're being entirely honest. Their bot lane in particular was really solid, but it was the jungle difference that really, really crept in. I already talked a bit about how Malrang's not really in meta right now. El Yoya is in meta, and he hadn't been great to start off this year, let's be entirely honest. It had been a slow first two games coming out from the Mad Lions jungler, but he's going to get player of the game in their third game and in their first win of the season on the Lee Sim. He was super active on the map, trying to make plays in the early game, honestly just out jungling and out pressuring what Malrang has been able to do and rough week for Malrang. We'll get to that in a second. But El Yoya, I thought generally speaking, did a good job making sure 
that his team had prior basically every time they needed it. You can look at this draft and you can see a lot of the ideas coming in. You have Lee Sin and then a bit of scaling along with the Talia to try and help get that scaling online. It can be a very dangerous draft into something like Draven, especially when the enemy jungler is Maorang, who likes to generate his early leads because if Koi is able to get a huge lead in this game, it's probably just not going away. The game is probably over at that point, but you're really up. You're really relying on your execution if you're Mad Lions, and luckily for them, they executed well. Yoy is really really solid, especially from ahead. I told you guys that I felt confidence that he'd be able to bounce back. There was a reason I considered him my number one jungler heading into the split and into the year, and I've considered him the number one jungler in Europe for a while. It's because I just always am going to have faith that eventually the real El Yoyo will show up, and in this series, he did, or in this game, I should say, he absolutely did on the Lee Sin. I want to give a lot of credit to Karzi in the bot lane as well. He's, got, he's not going to get nearly the same kind of credit that El Yoyo will get for this game, but I think he deserves just as much. He was actually really good. He He's another player who had a really rough start to the year. Him and Hilly did not have a good first couple of games in the spring split, but this was exactly what the doctor ordered for the bot lane, and that's a really, really good sign. Obviously, going into one of the better bot lanes last year, if not the best bot lane in Europe in 2022, a bot lane that has really fallen off, and they continue their downward spiral in this game. It looked like Mad was just kind of better across the map. Niski was really good at the shove and roam style that he really got fantastic at in 2022. Not necessarily what he was playing in winter split when he was an MVP caliber player, but more so what he was playing in summer of last year when he was the actual MVP of the league. And then Chase see on the Cassante. He played really well into Shigenda in the playoffs, and that continued here in this game. It just seems like Chasey has his number just a tad bit. Shigenda obviously had a really good game the day before this, not necessarily carrying that into day number three. But Mad, honestly, got to feel incredibly excited and incredibly happy to be able to pick up the win here. That was probably a big concern of theirs is you do not want to come out of week one after making finals going 0-3. That would have been an absolute disaster, but they are able to pick up a win against a Koi team that at the very least is talented. Yes, they have some problems, but congrats to Mad on picking up the win here. And then for Koi on the other side, their problems are becoming very apparent. This feels very similar to how they kicked off the season last year, or last split, I should say, where it just felt like, wow, is this team really falling off a cliff? Comp and Trimby aren't playing well. Malrang feels incredibly out of meta right now. Shigenda had a bad game, and Larson's just not the takeover kind of player. You're really relying on Comp getting super far ahead on this Draven, and while he did have some gold, he just didn't really do anything with it. Mad's bot lane was significantly more active in terms of skirmishes across the map, and that just made them significantly more effective. That's not to mention the fact that I think Trimby had a particularly bad game on the Soraka. He's going to get my dud of the game here. I still really like Trimby, but this was not the opening weekend that he was looking for. This is probably one of the worst weeks that he has played as an LEC pro, in my opinion, at least in terms of best of ones. This just was not it. He did not help the Draven get ahead at all. He pretty stubbornly picked the Soraka in this game, which I just don't think really offers all that much. I know he's pretty good at the pick, but I don't think team comp wise, the Soraka is really what you're looking for here. Uh, he was far from the only player to play bad, though. Obviously, people are going to shit on Shigenda up in the top lane. I thought he was fine for the most part. He certainly wasn't the biggest problem of the team, but it wasn't a great rebound game after he absolutely dominated on that same Jace pick the day before. Willing to cut him a bit of slack, if only because he's been the saving grace in their one win this season, but... Um, I still think that it wasn't a great performance, and Chasey clearly has his number when they go up against each other basically every single time they play. And then Malrang, like I said earlier, I'm a little bit worried that he's just not going to be able to rebound 2023 nearly as well. We're kind of leaving a meta where it is incredibly easy to gank a lot. Maorang being a super early game active jungler, it feels like his pressure just hasn't been there in 2023. Still like him as a player, but... I don't know, maybe he's not going to be a top three or four jungler this year. That just kind of is the trajectory that it feels like he's on right now. Koi is definitely starting to worry me a bit. Again, I'm not going to pull the rug out from under them. I'm not going to say they're not going to be like a top six team already, but they definitely are showing worrying signs, and I definitely wasn't comforted by this loss to Mad Lions. If anything, I definitely think I need to see a lot better from them as we move into the second week of the season. But as for Mad, it's kind of similar. Like, just because they won this game doesn't mean all of the worries that I had about this team are completely gone. I still have question marks about whether or not this team is going to be able to perform now that the league feels like it definitely has upgraded from winter. Obviously, this team is still consistent, but the bot lane worries me. They had a good game. El Yoya needs to keep this consistency. Nis he needs to get back to the form that he was at in winter, and Chasey needs to play like this every game instead of just every so often. Mad Lions, if they can get back to that form that they were sitting at just a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to feel a lot more comfortable than what they were in week number one. 
And then moving on to our fourth game of day number three here in week number one. And it's a battle between the team that won the split and the team that finished last in the split in winter. We had G2 Esports taking on Excel. And this one was much more competitive, even if it still was a little bit of a blowout as compared to whatever these two would have done or, or did in the winter split. G2 is still able to take the game because truthfully, they are still the better team. But at the end of the day, Excel's improvements really are on display here. And we'll get to them in a bit. But let's talk about G2 because this is a nice bounce back. Losing to Astralis on day two is certainly not what this team had in order, but... You know what's going to fix them right up? Draven, baby. Why do teams continuously give Draven over to Hansama? I I'm at the point where I just think that it's it's ego at this point, right? Like, there really is no logical reason for you to feel like you can play this. If you feel like you have some sort of counter, I get it. But, like, look at Excel's comp. I mean, nothing here particularly counters Draven. Ari's really good into Draven, but VTO's not going to be bot lane until mid-game. Uh, Aphelio certainly doesn't counter Draven. Nautilus certainly isn't going to completely neutralize Draven unless Hans plays really bad. And so, what exactly is the counter here? Like, they went for the 3v3 bot lane and just gave kills to the Draven anyways. It just feels so repetitive. It feels like teams are either just not respecting it or... They genuinely feel like they can beat it or that, I don't know, maybe they have a deal with G2 where it's like G2 just wants to practice it and see if teams can do something against it because I don't really know, man. I don't really know why teams would continuously let this team have this pick. Just let them beat you on something else. Astralis took it away and they won. They are currently 2-0 with Draven and 0-1 without Draven. That is where we're at. Not to say that G2 would lose every game without Draven, but at the very least, don't give them the Draven to prove them right. Like, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Hans is going to get player of the game. He was awesome on this pick. The only thing that I'm really worried about when it comes to G2 is that they're honestly maybe not getting enough stage practice right now. This team has been given their best picks pretty frequently over the course of this year so far. And while they've done decent when they haven't had those picks, I just don't know if stuff like this is going to hold up at an international level. That's literally the only concern I have. Because domestically, they're just really freaking good, especially when they get their comfort picks and they got it here. It wasn't just the Draven. Obviously, you know, Caps can play anything, but Yike has been playing a ton of Jarvan. I think he played Jarvan in all three games in week number one. Broken Blade's always played Kled at a very high level. That's one of the picks that I think he has been really active towards. Most EU top laners love themselves some Kled, even some mid laners, as we know with Caps. Um, and then obviously Hans and Mickey getting Draven Thresh. That's always going to be a positive. G2 is just kind of playing comfort, and that's not really what I want to see out of a team that has already qualified themselves for MSI, I don't want to see comfort. I want to see them try and take risks. I want to see them play comps that they're not as comfortable with. I want to see them not worry so much about winning right now and maybe try and, you know, figure stuff out. I'm criticizing this team for winning too much. That's the point I'm at with G2. And again, it's not like they're far and away the best team in the LEC or anything like that. Vitality is within their zone. I think that, you know, potentially a team like SK Gaming could, relatively speaking, be in their zone. But you know, G G2 is just one of those teams that I have so much faith in from a roster construction standpoint, from a coaching standpoint, from an organizational standpoint, that I'm not worried about this team in the LEC. It's just kind of interesting to see them dominate so much. Hans was awesome. Caps played this game really well. The Cassio ults were really good. Broken Blade dominated the top lane matchup on the Kled. Kled into Gragas is generally pretty positive for the Kled, so it's good to see Broken Blade take advantage of that. And then, like I said, Yike on Comfort playing a lot of Jarvan right now, probably trying to get a lot of that champion in before they end up heading to MSI. It's a really strong champion in solo queue right now, and I think that's kind of being reflected here with G2 pulling it out in draft. Overall, I just don't really have a lot of new things to say about this team. They're really good, and they got the picks they're really good at. If teams give them Draven and then run into the Draven in the first five minutes of the game, and Hans takes over, like... I don't really know how to grade that for G2. I don't know how to give you analysis for that because it's just like, what else is supposed to happen? G2 is just going to snowball the game out of control and basically win from there, and that's what happened in this one. As for Excel on the other side, outside of leaving up Draven, they didn't necessarily have an awful game. I mean, running it down to the Draven in the first five minutes, again, it just feels like teams have absolutely no idea what to do against G2. It makes me worry a lot about the mentality of teams at the bottom of the LEC standings, but... Outside of that, mechanically speaking, I actually think there were some positives to take away from this. Patrick, mechanically speaking, was really good, not only in this game, but this week in general. It was good to see. He wasn't necessarily great in the early laning phases, but he wasn't really given a lot of opportunities to. I was talking about how Aphelios hasn't been very good for LEC teams. Patrick
Patrick has typically been the exception to that rule. In my opinion, he has proven himself to be by far the best Ephelios player in the LEC, and I think that kind of came into here. Obviously, Exekick was super good on that on LDLC, but we'll have to see it in the, uh, in the LEC a little bit more consistently, but Patrick has always been really good at that champion. He's able to get it here, and while he does run it down a bit to Hans in the early game, he makes up for it by keeping this team alive in the mid game, unfortunately. It's just too much of a difference. G2 just ends up wiping him off the map if they land any sort of CC or damage onto him. VTO playing Ari, that's one of his signature picks. He didn't have a particularly good game. You really need that Ari charm to land on the Draven for you to be able to blow him up instantly for that uh, comp to really work out. You know, the Ari and the Vi really need to kind of work together to make sure Draven has a much harder time, and that didn't work because the Vi was also not very useful. My dead of the game is going to go to Xerxe in the jungle. Just one of those games where it felt like the Vi wasn't particularly useful. He wasn't able to generate any sort of lead for his team in the early game, and so by the mid game, he was ulting in and basically immediately dying. Not to mention the multiple times that him and the rest of the team just didn't really seem to be on the same page, mostly him and Odawamne, which is certainly not the first time that's happened this year. We saw multiple times where Xerxe would dive the back line, get onto the Draven, and then we would see the uh, Gragas cast come out and just immediately peel the backliner to safety, and it's like, these two just don't seem to be in the same like mental zone right now. I don't know if it's Odo, I don't know if it's Xerxe. I don't really know who to blame it on, but they just don't seem to be connected, and hopefully that's not a problem that continues for Excel. Obviously, it was a very big issue for them in winter, but I think generally speaking, their macro is already shown to have gotten better. I think Limit coming in is really limited a lot of the, um, I don't know, big mistakes that this team has made. I think they've been a little bit more clear and concise at the very least on the calls that they do want to go for. It's just the execution that I think they have to step up now because the execution in this game just wasn't particularly good. But overall, Excel losing here isn't a big surprise. You would have hoped they would have put up at least a little bit more of a fight, maybe just ban Draven. But at the end of the day, at the very least, they went toe to toe with G2 and they didn't get absolutely slaughtered. I think there is something in that, even if it was kind of a G2 super focused game, this Excel team is certainly better looking than they were in winter, and uh, I think they will almost certainly get more than one win this year, if I had to guess. And then for G2 on the other side, this team is really good, but I just want to see them do something else besides play Draven. At this point, I feel super confident that basically no matter who they play in this region, if they get that pick, they're going to win. That's not really what I'm concerned about at this point. Let's use regular season to experiment a bit more. Maybe I'm just too lofty with my expectations. Maybe I'm too high on this G2 team, but it really does feel like they've got the LEC relatively unlocked. I mean, they're already going to MSI. I, I want to see some development. I want to see some growth. I have faith that this team's going to be able to do it no matter what, but that's really what's going to change their fate internationally to me. And that's going to bring us to our 15th and final game of the week here. And it was a little bit of a blowout. Not necessarily super competitive, but probably pretty cathartic for one player in particular. We had Team Vitality taking on Fnatic. And Vitality utterly obliterates this Fnatic team. This is the exact opposite of what you wanted to see if you were a Fnatic fan, at the very least. Maybe you didn't go into this game expecting to be able to pick up a win. Vitality's a really good team, and you're struggling as of late, but you had to at least maybe be, look for, maybe be looking for something competitive, for something that wasn't an utter destruction of your team. Unfortunately, that's just not what you got. In this game here, Vitality looks like the better team, and they look like it by a lot here. Let's go ahead and talk about it. There really isn't a lot of analysis that I can give. I can give bits and pieces, but this was a little bit of a skill gap at certain points. For Vitality, my player of the game was pretty up for debate, but I did end up giving it to the jungler here in Bo. I think I've kind of undershot Bo a bit over the course of the year so far when it comes to, like, player of the games and stuff, and even how I've talked about him, I haven't really come across as, like, the biggest Bo lever in the world, but I really like Bo. I think he's a really good player. A lot of people were really surprised to see me move him up to number two in my jungle rankings, especially considering kind of just how I talked about him over the course of Winter Split is kind of, kind of this Feast or Famine player. But I do think that his mechanics are just better than everybody else's at that position. And yes, that means his, you know, brain sometimes turns off and he goes and he makes some plays that I definitely wouldn't recommend junglers make and he can have some bad games. He didn't necessarily end off the season on a very hot note, but I think Bo, especially getting more time playing with a lot of these players, getting the communication structure, getting a more stable bot side that he can actually play towards in the early game, it's only going to help him out a lot. And I think he was the best player in this game. I think a lot of people are going to want to give it to Photon in the top lane, who I am very high on, as I'm sure this channel knows. But I'm going to give it to Bo. I just think the impact that he was able to have moving around the map, creating advantages in the early game on a champion that a lot of people aren't using as a big early game creator right now in Gragas. 
was just super impressive. Yes, his top lane was winning. Yes, his mid lane was winning pretty hard, but he still had to do a bit of work, and I, I want to give him a lot of credit for that, of course. Everybody else on the team was still really good. Photon obliterated this top lane matchup. It's Camille into Orn. If you can get that Camille rolling, Orn's tank stats are not going to come until later in the game, and you can really blast him, and that's what Photon did. Oscar in him. We'll talk about it a bit. Not the debut weekend he was looking for really at all. Uh, definitely stats-wise, maybe one of the worst we've ever seen, but... We'll get to that. I thought Photon was awesome. He continues to look like an MVP caliber player. In my opinion, just the most talented top laner in the league by such a large margin. It was the reason he was my MVP. It's not really because there weren't players in other roles that were dominating like Photon. It's that he was the only top laner that was dominating in the way that he was. It is a considerably weak role in the LEC, and Photon just makes that difference look so massive, right? Photon is so much better than every other top laner that plays that it honestly is super noticeable, and it was noticeable in this game. Perks was really good on the Azir. He didn't even get a kill this game, and his Deathless streak dies this game, but at the end of the day, he dominated Humanoid in lane so hard that I don't really care what the stat line looks like. It was, I mean, just watching it, the pressure that he was able to put out there in mid lane was incredibly impressive. And then Upset and Kaiser, their scores end up looking good. They gave up a bit of pressure early. I actually give a lot of credit to Reckless for being able to generate like a small lead around five or so minutes, but as soon as Advien started rolling, as soon as the macro really started to fall apart for Fnatic, uh, Upset and Kaiser very quickly regained that advantage and ended up having a really good game down in the bot lane. Really, there was not a lot of weaknesses coming from the side of Vitality here. Everybody's playing at such a high level, and this team genuinely looks unstoppable at the moment. As for Fnatic on the other side, this is depressing at this point. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm kind of right. This is the worst team in the league, and they look like it right now. They really, really do look like it. Oscar Rinnan's going to get done of the game. He just might be the worst player in the LEC right now. This was a miserable opening weekend. I think he was like 0-18-4 or something across three games. That is just, I mean, you can ask for three worst games. And I feel really bad for the kid because obviously the expectations on him coming in were ridiculously high. He needed to be able to step in and be good basically from day one. And this is just not a player that was ever really touted to be that kind of player. He's a solid carry-oriented guy, but... Sticking him on Orn, sticking him on Nar, it's just not really something that, you know, I, I would really expect from this team or that I would really advise this team to do. It's not like the rest of his team has been helping him. Razork has had another really, really slow and bad start to the split. Humanoid has been just completely nothing out of the mid lane. His stat line is honestly better than how he played. Only one death doesn't really signify the fact... I guess it does. It signifies the fact that he wasn't doing anything. He wasn't dying, you're right, but... There is a real chance that he got out damaged by his support in this game. I'd have to check, but like, I don't remember the LeBlanc actually doing anything at any points. And that's been the case for him basically in every game. It just looks like he's basically given up. Razork is forcing plays that aren't working. Oscar Rinnan doesn't have the talent to be able to compete. Reckless was doing all right for a bit. Advien was doing all right. They tried to salvage a bit of the rest of the map, and that's when everything went to shit in the bot lane. But Reckless' score absolutely does not represent, you know, him. He was by far the best player on this team, not only in this game, but this week in general, in my opinion. And honestly, that's a bad sign. Like, Reckless, you know, I, I do think that he's an okay LEC player. I was talking about that last split. He's not this disaster in the bot lane that some people like to say he is, but he's certainly not good enough to be the strength of a team that wants to make, like, even, like, top eights. Like, if Reckless is your best player, that's a problem. He does not have the ability to carry games at this level, and that's being shown off here. Oscar, Razwork, and Humanoid have been the worst top side in the LEC this year, or this split, and it's not even close. This week was abysmal for Fnatic, and honestly, I'm really worried that it's not going to get better. They really haven't shown me a lot to make me believe that it is going to get better, and so... You know, fingers crossed for all the Fnatic fans out there that something changes for this team, but I just don't really see it as all that likely. As for Vitality on the other side, complete opposite story to be said. They are an incredibly strong team that feels like they are starting to get rid of any weaknesses that they had in winter, of course. I still need to see them do it down the stretch. This was a very similar story to how Vitality started out the winter split, where they looked unbeatable, even with their weak side bot. Bot lane obviously is a lot better this split. Upset is winning games for this team. Kaiser is looking fantastic. However, I got to make sure that that top side doesn't start to disintegrate as we get into the later weeks. The jungle mid in particular, I need to see step up, especially in the group stage. But if any team is going to do that, I feel comfortable with it being this version of Vitality. I know this organization hasn't exactly had success with lasting later on into seasons, but this roster is just simply too talented to fumble it at the finish line.
All right, that is going to do it for my LEC Spring Split Week 1 overview and analysis of all 15 games across all three days. Up on the screen right now, you're going to see the updated LEC standings after three games, after one week of action. Of course, a lot of ties. That's because there really haven't been enough games to separate teams. Of course, in the first column to the right, you're going to see my updated power rankings in the second column, how those have changed from last week to this week. Let's go over the risers, the followers, and just how things shake out. A lot of people are probably going to want to see Vitality sitting at number one in my power rankings, but it's just too soon for me to see G2 drop. I know they lost that game to Astralis, but G2 does this all the time. I still have confidence that they are the best team in the league as of right now, but Vitality is making a really strong case for that number one spot if things go a different way in week number two. Perhaps we could see a new champion at the top of the rankings, but they stay in the top two for sure. SK Gaming jumps up to number three. They are clearly closer to the top two than they are to the middle of the pack right now. They are playing at an absolutely unbelievable level. Great 3-0 weekend from them. If they can keep that up, they're going to stay there. Mad drops to number four. I still think that they're going eventually to be a good team, but a little bit of a rough week for them. I still have faith though. That's why I'm not dropping them lower. Astralis moving up to number five. A really good week. They played a really hot SK Gaming team, but outside of that, it's just big win after big win coming in for this Astralis team. If they can keep it up, they're going to be a top six team. And then BDS rounding out the top six. That means falling out of the top six is Koi, who falls to number seven. I was not impressed at all with this team this week. I still have faith that they should be a top six team either by the end of the regular season or by the end of the group stage. But right now, I would be remiss to put them anywhere near it because I just don't believe in them more than I believe in any of the teams that are in the top six right now. And then a new team at number eight, it's going to be Excel jumping up from number 10. I have faith that this team would work their way out of the bottom two as the split went on. I still don't think they're going to be world beaters by any means, but they looked significantly more competitive than either the bottom two teams, in my opinion, and also than whatever they were in winter. That means the bottom two teams are now Heretics at nine, and Fnatic in dead last at 10. I just really can't think of any other two that deserve to be in the bottom two right now. They were clearly the two worst teams in the LEC, not only from a record standpoint, but just from competing. Yankos was dragging Heretics across the finish line, and yet they still couldn't win a game. And Fnatic, it just feels like everything possible is going wrong right now. So they sit at 9 and 10, and those are the power rankings after week number one. But let's go ahead and talk about player of the week and dud of the week. My player of the week was a really easy choice in the LEC in week number one. It's going to go to Hansama on G2. He was just so good for the team. I really don't know how you could pick anybody else, if I'm being entirely honest. Maybe someone like Irrelevant is in the conversation. Maybe someone like Upset is in the conversation. But for me, the two games of Draven that he got were so utterly dominant and so game-changing. I just don't think anybody else in the LEC had that kind of week. So Hansama is going to be getting my player of the week for week number one. And my dud of the week... Honestly, this was a tough decision only because there were two people who played so bad this week that I felt bad not giving them one, not giving one of them dud of the week, but I'm going to give it to Oscar Rennan on Fnatic. It really couldn't have been anybody else. Ruby scrapes by this week. He was trying his best to earn this award, but I have to give dud of the week in week number one to Oscar Rennan on Fnatic. This is maybe one of the worst debuts that we've seen in the LEC ever. Obviously, he's got talent to be able to turn this around, but when you're talking about ways to debut, this was maybe the single worst way it could have possibly happened. So my week one dud of the week is Oscar Rennan, and my week one player of the week is Hansama. But that's going to do it. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, let me know down in the comment section below. Who am I too high on? Who am I too low on? Who was your player of the week? Dead of the week. You know I love to hear you guys' thoughts and feedback down in the comments. Of course, keep it respectful. I love having the conversation with you guys, but this is just an opinion after all. Um, of course, if you are new here, hit that subscribe button. I don't only cover the LEC on this channel. I do weekly recaps of all four of the major regions as well as the NACL. And with playoffs approaching, I'm going to be doing primers for every single region as well as coverage of every single region's playoffs. So get excited for that and hit subscribe if you haven't. Of course, hit the like button if you haven't on this video already. It's almost two hours long. And that's what the LEC brings you now that there's 15 games. I really enjoy making these videos, but they are definitely time consuming. So it really would mean a lot to me if you hit that like button. But with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day. And I will see you all later.